I spent some summers working on my cousin's farm outside Santa Fe when I was younger. Hard work, but you'd get used to the rhythm of it. Now I'm more of a city guy, so when I got word that cousin Thaddeus had passed, well, it wasn't exactly a heartbreak. Still, when a lawyer reads a will and your name's on it, you pay attention. Turns out, Thaddeus had left me a tidy little plot of land on the outskirts of his property. I wasn't about to move to the middle of nowhere, but hey, extra cash doesn't hurt. Figured I'd drive out, spend a few days checking the place over, and get it listed. That August heat ain't no joke, let me tell you. Evenings, I'd crack open a cold one and sit on the porch trying not to get eaten alive by mosquitoes the size of hummingbirds. One night, must have been round midnight, I was just about to turn in when I saw it. A flicker of movement way back by the old tree line. Now, city boy like me, first thought is someone's trespassing, probably some teenagers out to do whatever trouble kids get into these days. But then I realized how damn quiet it was. No giggling, no rustling of bushes, nothing. My neck prickled, but I'll be damned if I spook easy. I grabbed a flashlight, one of those big, heavy ones, and crept towards the trees. Whatever it was, it had vanished. All I found were these, tracks you know. I'd seen plenty of coyote and deer prints around the place, but these were different. Big, way too big with the toes kind of spread out, like a hand. Gave me the creeps, but I figured maybe some weird mutated dog or something. Next morning, I went into town and found myself telling the whole damn story to old Mrs. Benitez at the diner. Figured the locals might know what critters were out there, right? Her face went all tight the minute I described those tracks. Mi niño, she said, crossing herself. You keep your eyes open, see? The desert, she holds old things. She wouldn't say nothing more, just kept muttering and refilling my coffee. Kinda wish I'd left it at that, but the whole thing had me riled up. Back at the house, I dug out Thaddeus' old hunting rifle. Wasn't much of a marksman, but it felt better than nothing. That night, I didn't bother with the porch. I sat inside, lights off, rifle across my lap, staring out at the tree line. Hours passed, my eyes starting to burn. Almost drifted off a couple times, but a noise would snap me back, a branch snapping, the distant howl of a coyote. Just when I was about to call it quits for the night, I saw it again. This time, it didn't disappear so quick. A silhouette hunched beneath the biggest cottonwood, just on the edge of the light. Lord, it was massive, way taller than a person, and kinda hunched over. Then it moved, and Jesus, I ain't never seen nothing like it. Two long strides, smooth as anything, and it was across the clearing, vanishing into the darkness. I was frozen, heart pounding in my ears. Then I swear... From deeper in the trees, I heard what sounded like laughing. A high-pitched giggle that cut right through the night. Next morning, I didn't waste any time. Found a realtor, agreed on a price, and hightailed it back to the city. Now, folks can call me a fool, say it was just a bear or something. But I know what I saw, and I know these things ain't supposed to be out there. Let some other poor sap inherit that land. Mrs. Benitez, she was right. Desert holds old things, things that are best left buried. I spent last weekend with my friends at a rustic cabin in the hills outside of Red Bluff, California. You know the kind of place, no cell service, a wood-burning stove as your only heat source, and complete silence at night except for the wind rustling through the dense pines. 
Honestly, it sounds way more idyllic than it was. The place was a bit rundown, and between the creaky noises and our overactive imaginations, I spent half the nights thinking the place was haunted. My friends, bless their hearts, tried to keep things light. We roasted marshmallows, played cards, and told stories, but the place definitely had a spooky vibe. A few of them went on a hike after lunch on Saturday, leaving me and my friend, Ishan, hanging out in the musty, old living room. Bored, I started flipping through one of the dusty books on the shelves. Whoa, check this out, I said to Ishan, thumbing through a faded, leather-bound book. It was full of hand-drawn sketches and notes about local legends and folklore. Ooh, creepy, he said, only half-interested. But I was completely hooked. One entry, in particular, caught my eye. It described a creature said to roam the woods nearby, a gnarled and twisted being that locals called the snag. Legend had it that the snag preyed on people lost in the woods. There was even a crude drawing, depicting a figure with limbs like tangled roots, its face contorted in a permanent, horrifying scream. That's some nightmare fuel right there, I said to Ishan, laughing nervously. He shrugged, indifferent. We flipped through a few more pages, finding sketches of strange symbols and whispers of rituals, but ultimately decided the book was more silly than creepy. Still, I couldn't get that image of the snag out of my head. As darkness crept in, I found myself on edge, jumping at every little noise. My friends finally came back, full of energy from their hike. Guess what, there's a clearing a few miles out, we should all go tonight, suggested Alara, the most adventurous of our group. It sounded like an awful idea, a literal horror movie setup but with the cabin's dreary atmosphere hanging over me, the thought of a campfire under the stars seemed appealing. Foolishly, I agreed. After grabbing flashlights and stuffing our pockets with snacks, we headed out. It was a chilly night, the moonlight a soft glow, and the air was crisp under the expanse of sky. As we ventured farther into the woods, my earlier anxieties started to resurface. The flashlights cut through the darkness, but the shadows seemed to dance and shift in unsettling ways. My eyes played tricks on me, seeing gnarled shapes and eerie faces in the tangle of branches. Then, just when I thought I was about to jump out of my skin, we reached the clearing. It was a small, grassy opening surrounded by towering trees, a peaceful oasis in the sprawling forest. Elara pulled out her lighter and started the fire while the rest of us scattered, looking for firewood. A sense of relief washed over me, and my silly fears melted away. I wandered deeper into the trees, scanning the forest floor for fallen branches. Just as I was about to give up and turn back, I saw it, a thick, twisted shape jutting out from behind a huge oak. My heart pounded in my chest and that horrible sketch of the snag flashed across my mind. There was something so unnatural about its form, like roots forced into the shape of something humanoid. It took me a few seconds to process what I was seeing. It couldn't be real, right? But then it moved. A slow, unnatural twist, and a dry snapping sound echoed through the clearing. Frozen in terror, I stared at it, this thing that shouldn't exist. A scream pierced the air, and suddenly everyone was running towards me. Alara was at the front, her face pale with fear. She grabbed my arm and pulled me back towards the clearing. What's wrong? What did you see? She demanded as we ran. Struggling to catch my breath, I choked out. Some something in the woods! They exchanged wide-eyed glances, but nobody slowed down. We sprinted towards the fire, the crackle of the flames and the smell of wood smoke offering some small comfort. Gasping for air, I huddled behind Alara. 
When I dared to look back into the trees, I saw nothing. The thing, whatever it was, had vanished. I recounted what I saw, my voice shaky and uncertain. I expected them to laugh, to dismiss my fears with a logical explanation. But to my surprise, they were quiet. Fear flickered in their eyes. Then Ishan spoke, his voice hushed. You saw it, didn't you? The snag. They knew. Somehow they all knew about the legend, the thing I had stumbled upon just a few hours earlier. A chill ran down my spine, deeper than any cold wind could reach. We should put the fire out, get back to the cabin, Elara said, her voice barely above a whisper. Without another word, they started dousing the flames. There was a frantic energy to their movements, a shared understanding of the danger we were in. We plunged back into the woods, our flashlights cutting through the darkness like feeble swords against the encroaching shadows. My heart hammered against my ribs, every creak and rustle sending fresh waves of panic through me. Back at the cabin, we barricaded the door as if that flimsy piece of wood could keep us safe. Huddled together, every creak and groan of the old structure sent a shiver of terror through the group. Every shadow seemed to twist and shift, taking on monstrous shapes. We stayed up all night, nobody daring to even suggest sleep. My thoughts raced, a jumble of fear and disbelief. Had I really seen that creature? Or was my imagination, fueled by a silly story in a dusty old book, playing tricks on me? As the first fingers of dawn reached across the sky, a sense of exhausted relief settled over us. We hadn't heard or seen anything else, but the palpable fear lingered. We quickly packed our things, the once inviting cabin now feeling like a trap. As we pulled away, I turned for one last look at the woods. They stretched out before me, dark and silent. Was it all just a product of my overactive imagination? A trick of the light and shadows? Or was there something truly monstrous lurking in those trees, a creature that defied reason and reality? I didn't know for sure and the truth is, maybe I didn't want to. I spent last weekend with my friends at a lakeside cabin in the Adirondacks. Man, we needed that break. It's been nuts at work lately, and between that and the city grind, I was about ready to lose my mind. My buddy, Cuddale, found the rental. The whole rustic cabin in the woods thing was his idea. Swears it's the real way to unplug, to let nature reset your brain chemicals or whatever. The rest of us, Covey, Yannick, and I, just wanted some beer and a break from real life. We hit the road Friday afternoon, which, with New York traffic, meant we didn't get to the lake until after dark. No big deal. It's been a while since any of us spent real time just hanging out, so the late drive was just more time to catch up. Cadell's an architect, all serious about his modern designs, but he's been with us since college, so mostly we just give him crap about his fancy tastes. The cabin itself was exactly what you'd expect, all rough-hewn logs, big stone fireplace, and those antler-light fixtures that make me vaguely uncomfortable. The power was already on, which was a bonus, and the place was surprisingly clean for a rental. Yannick, as usual, immediately staked out the biggest bedroom like it was his birthright. You'd never guess the guy's a lawyer unless you saw him in a courtroom. Most of the time, he's just a laid-back goofball who takes every opportunity to relax. The rest of the night was just what the doctor ordered. Cadale grilled the steaks he'd brought, we cracked open beers— Covey put on some old-school playlists full of tunes that made us feel like teenagers again. It was perfect. 
No phones, no internet, just a deck overlooking the lake, the flickering firelight, and some much-needed time to just reconnect. The next morning, we woke up late and lounged around with coffee for way longer than any of us would admit to on a normal weekday. That's when I started to notice the smell. Kind of a musty, organic smell, almost like rotting leaves, but sweeter. It wasn't strong, but definitely there. Covey noticed it too, started wrinkling her nose. Kadeel and Yannick, ever the dudes, just shrugged it off. Dude, it's the woods, Yannick said. You expect it to smell like Ducci in here? Fair point, but it wasn't quite that simple. The smells seemed to be coming from outside, but with all the trees so close to the cabin, it was impossible to pinpoint the source. Figured we'd air the place out, see if it helped. We opened the big windows overlooking the lake, let the fresh breeze in. That's when things got weird. We heard this noise. It started as a sort of chittering sound, low and raspy, like an animal clicking its teeth, or like a big insect or something. At first, it was far off, but then it grew stronger. We all froze. This wasn't a squirrel, or even a raccoon. It sounded big, and wrong. Cadale, being Cadale, decided to go all National Geographic on us. Let's check it out. He announced, already heading towards the trees. Whoa, hold up, said Yannick who for once in his life actually seemed concerned. Maybe we should just, like, close the windows and ignore it? Covey and I gave him a look. You see, Yannick's a city boy through and through. He's not exactly the outdoorsy type. Come on, it's probably nothing, Cadell said, but I heard the slight uncertainty in his voice. The four of us moved as a group, none of us really wanting to be left alone. The noises were louder now, definitely coming from deeper in the trees. And the smell, that rotten sweetness clung to the air, thick and sickly. Suddenly, Yannick let out a strangled yelp and pointed. Over there! What the hell is that? We followed his gaze, and my stomach clenched. About twenty yards in, Crouched amongst the trees was a thing. It was hunched over, almost folded in on itself, so it was hard to make out its shape properly. But whatever it was, it was big, with glistening, hairless skin that looked almost translucent in the patches of sunlight that filtered through the branches. It had a long, sinuous neck and what looked like impossibly long, spindly limbs. Its head jerked in a twitchy, unnatural way, like a bird searching for prey. For a frozen second, we just stared in horror. Then the creature slowly unfurled itself, rising to what had to be at least seven feet tall. It turned its head towards us, and I finally got a clear look at its face. It had no eyes. Just smooth skin where its eyes should be. Instead, its face ended in these gaping black slits like nostrils, flaring in and out as it breathed. Below that was a jagged mouth filled with what looked like needle-sharp teeth. It hissed at us, a low, guttural sound that made my hair stand on end. And then it moved. Not like a normal animal. It lunged toward us in a grotesque, jerky motion, its impossibly long limbs propelling it forward with surprising speed. Inside! Get inside! Cadale screamed, breaking the paralysis that had held us all captive. We turned and ran for the cabin, slamming the heavy wooden door shut behind us. The thing slammed into the door with a sickening thud, throwing its weight against it again and again. Barricade the door! Covey shouted, panic rising in her voice. We frantically shoved the heavy dresser and armchair in front of the door, stacking them up as a makeshift barrier. The sickening smell was overpowering now, seeping through the cracks around the doorframe. And all the while, the creature kept pounding relentlessly, 
each hit rattling the entire cabin. Yannick scrambled for his phone, but there was no signal out here. Where the hell was the landline? Covey grabbed one of the kitchen knives, hand shaking. I had no idea what to do. Was there a gun somewhere, anything? The door buckled under the next onslaught, wood groaning loudly. Cadale grabbed a cast-iron skillet, the only weapon he could find in the kitchen. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. The door was giving way now, chunks of wood splintering under the relentless assault. We were running out of time. We were trapped. The monster kept battering at the barricaded door, its grotesque form casting monstrous shadows that danced across the wall in the flickering firelight. I swear, every time I saw that smooth, eyeless face and those twitching limbs, another wave of pure terror washed over me. We have to do something! Yannick screamed over the din, his voice tight with panic. It's going to break through! Cadell scanned the room desperately. There has to be something in here. An axe, a saw, anything. My mind raced. We were sitting ducks in this cabin. Even if we managed to hold the thing off for a bit longer, what then? It knew we were here. Eventually, it would find a way in, or we'd run out of places to hide. We needed a plan. Then it hit me. The car! I shouted. The others stared at me like I'd lost my mind, but Covey caught on. Distract it long enough to get out to the garage. It was a crazy idea, but it might just work. The garage was detached from the cabin, a good thirty-yard dash across open ground. It was our only chance. Yannick found Cadell's hunting rifle stowed in a closet the architect with the secret stash, who knew. He checked it over, then turned to Covey. You're the best shot here. Can you cover us? A flicker of doubt crossed Covey's face, but then she gripped the rifle with a determined nod. I'll try. Okay, on my count, Cadell said, taking a deep breath. Three, two, one, go! He flung open the door and for one heart-stopping second, the creature was just surprised. Then, it let out an ear-splitting shriek and lunged forward. Covey fired and the sharp crack of the rifle cut through the air. The thing staggered, but it didn't go down. We bolted outside, sprinting for the garage as the monster recovered and came after us. Fear propelled me, legs pumping like pistons. I felt its breath, hot and putrid, on my neck, heard the rasp of its claws against the ground. Yannick reached the garage door first and frantically wrestled with the lock. Come on, come on, he cursed. The thing was almost upon us. Covey fired again, and this time, it stumbled. I dove forward just as the garage door swung open and rolled inside. The others followed, slamming the door shut behind us just as the creature crashed into it, snarling in frustration. We slumped to the ground, panting, hearts pounding in our chests. For a moment, there was just the harsh sound of our own breathing and the monsters enraged scrabbling at the door. What the hell do we do now? Yannick whimpered, his bravado gone. Just like before, we found ourselves trapped, only this time in an even smaller space. The garage was packed with tools, but I knew none of them were matched for the thing outside. Desperation rose in my throat. We weren't going to make it. Suddenly, Cadell sat up straight. The gas can! He pointed to a red container in the corner. We can make a fire. Try to drive it back. It wasn't a great plan, but it was a plan. Yannick found a lighter, and Cadell carefully soaked a torn-up rag in gasoline. With trembling hands, he lit the makeshift torch and cracked open the garage door just a sliver. The creature was there, waiting, bathed in the blood-red glow of the torchlight. 
It hissed and recoiled, momentarily blinded. That was our chance. Kadeil tossed the torch out and slammed the door shut again. We heard the roar of the flames, followed by the monster's maddened screeches. For a few excruciating minutes we waited breath held. Slowly, the shrieks began to fade, replaced by the crackling of the fire. We had bought ourselves some time. Now what? We couldn't stay in the garage forever. Yet how could we be sure the monster was truly gone? Finally, Kadeel, voice tense, said what we were all thinking. We have to make a run for it. Back to the car, back to the road. It's our only shot. We agreed, though none of us felt confident about our chances. The thing was out there, somewhere in the woods. Hurt, maybe, but probably just as deadly. Carefully, we opened the garage door, weapons at the ready. The clearing was empty, the remains of the fire smoldering. We moved stealthily, eyes darting everywhere for any sign of movement. The forest felt unnaturally quiet, a silence that screamed with hidden danger. We reached the car and flung ourselves inside, locking the doors fumblingly. Kadeo twisted the key in the ignition, the engine roaring to life. He slammed the car into gear and we hurtled down the dirt road, the trees whizzing by in a blur. None of us spoke. We just drove, fueled by adrenaline and fear, putting as much distance as possible between us and that cursed cabin. After what felt like hours, we finally saw the lights of the main road ahead. Civilization. Safety. Relief washed over me like a tidal wave. We had made it. We were alive. We reported the incident to the local park rangers and the police. Of course, they didn't fully believe us. Who would? But they searched the area, even found the burned-out husk of the cabin. The creature, however, was nowhere to be seen. It had vanished back into the wilderness, becoming another terrifying legend whispered around campfires. The authorities called it a wild animal attack, maybe a bear gone rabid, they said. But we knew. We knew what we had seen in those woods, the eyeless monster that lurked in the shadows. The locals started calling it the Taker of the Trees, one of those old, half-forgotten tales turned terrifyingly real. We never went back to the Adirondacks. Sometimes, at night, I still hear the rasping chitters and smell the sickly sweet rot, the memory of that day etched into my mind. We survived, but something out there, something dark and unnatural, still haunts the woods. I live in this small, quiet town of Willow Creek, tucked away in the redwood forests of Northern California. I always joke that we're the kind of place people either move to for the peace and quiet, or disappear to completely. It's mostly a logging and ranching town, the kind of place where folks know each other's business. Well, most folks. I tend to keep to myself. It was late summer, and the hot... Humid days were already starting to give way to that crisp autumn chill in the air. This past week, I was up in the forest working on my cabin with a good friend of mine, Ryland. Ryland runs one of the local sawmills, so he knows the backwoods around here like the back of his hand. My cabin's not really anything fancy, just a place to get away for some peace and quiet. We'd been up there all week working hard during the day and hanging by the campfire at night. Nothing out of the ordinary, really. This one evening, right before dusk, I got it in my head that I wanted to head into town and grab some beers for us. Ryland had just finished up some last-minute stuff on the roof, so I figured I'd slip out, make the run, and be back before he even finished up. That way, we could kick back, crack a cold one, and just relax. 
The drive down to Willow Creek isn't exactly thrilling. Just a winding dirt road through the thick of the redwoods. I figured it would take maybe half an hour to get there and another half an hour back. But as I rounded a bend, something big bolted out of the trees right in front of my truck. I slammed on the brakes, swerving hard to one side. In that split second I saw it, a blur of dark fur and a flash of something white. I don't know what it was, some animal, for sure. But it was big. My heart was pounding in my chest as I pulled the truck to a stop. I sat there, just trying to catch my breath. I wasn't exactly shaken up, more so just surprised. After a moment, I figured that whatever it was had bolted off into the woods and it was safe to continue. But as I got back onto the road and started driving, something felt off. There was a stillness to the forest, a sort of silence that felt wrong. I know it sounds dumb, but the woods here are usually alive with noise. Birds chirping, insects buzzing, the breeze whistling through the trees. This time, though, there was nothing. Just a dead quiet that was starting to get under my skin. I started scanning the trees as I drove, my eyes flicking from shadow to shadow. There was something out there. I could feel it. This sense of being watched, a prickling sensation on the back of my neck. I picked up speed a bit, trying to shake off that feeling of unease. And that's when I saw it. A flicker of movement in the trees, just off the road. And then, a pair of eyes. Not reflecting my headlights like an animal's would, but glowing. Just two pinpricks of a strange, pale yellow hovering in the darkness. I slammed on the brakes again, my whole body tensing up. The eyes didn't vanish. Instead, they started moving slowly towards the road and that's when I saw the shape they belonged to. It was tall and hunched over, its gait uneven and almost jerking. I couldn't make out a lot of details. Its body was shrouded in shadow for the most part, but I saw its arms. They were too long, ending in these bony, gnarled hands with way too many fingers. Its whole form seemed elongated somehow, distorted, like it was barely holding itself together. And then there was its head. Too big, too elongated for a person. Its face, when the moonlight finally hit it, was long and gaunt. I saw its mouth open, a wide, gaping maw filled with rows of jagged teeth. Too many teeth. I couldn't look away. It was like a train wreck, horrifying, and yet I couldn't force myself to tear my gaze away from that awful sight. A growl started deep in the creature's throat, a low, rasping sound that made my stomach churn. It started moving towards my truck faster this time, its gangly limbs twitching. Finally, I snapped out of it. I threw the truck in reverse, tires screeching on the dirt as I backed up as fast as I could. I needed to get the hell out of there. I didn't know what the hell that thing was but I knew I didn't want to stick around and find out. I kept my eyes glued to the rearview mirror, half expecting that creature to burst out of the trees at any moment. But it didn't. I reversed all the way until I hit the main road, and then I slammed the truck into drive and sped off towards town. The last thing I saw as I rounded the bend was those glowing eyes, just staring out of the darkness. That image would haunt my nightmares for months. I burst into the only bar in Willow Creek, startling a few of the regulars. I must have looked like a man-man. I slammed my hands on the bar and practically yelled at the bartender. Give me a whiskey, double! He obliged, looking at me with a mix of concern and amusement. I downed the drink in one go, barely feeling the burn as the warmth spread through me. I needed to tell someone what I had seen, but who would believe me? Then, I spotted Rylan sitting in a booth with a couple of the other lumberjacks, just laughing and shooting the breeze. 
Relieved, I made my way over to him, figuring I'd just recount the whole thing and get it off my chest. He'd probably give me some good-natured ribbing about being spooked by a bear or mountain lion, but at least I wouldn't be alone with whatever the hell I'd run into. As I got closer, I could see the worry etched on Ryland's face, and it wasn't the playful kind. He kept glancing over my shoulder, a frown creasing his forehead. He looked right past me, like I wasn't even there. What the hell's going on, Re? Why are you acting so weird? I reached out to put a hand on his shoulder, but he recoiled like I had burned him. That's when the others joined him, all getting up from the booth and moving like one unit. Every single one of them had the same haunted look in their eyes as they circled around me, closing in. I saw it. I blurted out. Whatever's been out in the woods. The thing. I saw it tonight. You've got to believe me. Their faces remained blank, like masks. The hair on the back of my neck stood straight up. This wasn't right. This wasn't how my friends acted. What the hell was happening? Re, come on, it's me. I backpedaled. Hands in the air like some cliché bad horror movie. The tension in the air was so thick you could choke on it. The bartender, bless him, must have sensed something was off because he suddenly appeared out of nowhere with a baseball bat in his hands. He stood defensively in front of them, blocking them from getting too close. Listen, guys. If this is about that story you told at the campfire the other night, the joke's over. Seriously, you're freaking him out. The bartender tried to reason with them, but it fell on deaf ears. Ryland stepped forward, his voice low and guttural, not an ounce of my good oil buddy Ryland in it. This isn't a game. He's seen it. The walker. The others echoed that last bit, the walker, in a hushed chorus, sending a shiver down my spine. The walker? I choked out. It sounded ridiculous, like something straight out of a B-movie, but given the circumstances, I wasn't exactly in the mood to laugh. Suddenly, they were on us. They rushed the bartender, and he swung the bat, taking out the first one and knocking another down. I shoved past the melee, my heart pounding a deafening rhythm in my ears. These weren't my buddies anymore. They were animals, possessed by some primal force I didn't understand. I bolted out the bar's back door, crashing into the alleyway behind it. The damp smell of garbage and old beer hung heavy in the air, stinging my nostrils as I ran. I heard the bar door burst open, followed by shouts and the thudding of heavy footsteps. The alley was a maze, twisting and turning at every corner. I ran blindly, not even trying to find a way out, just focused on putting distance between myself and those things that used to be my friends. My lungs burned as I stumbled through the darkness, my sides aching with each ragged breath. The sounds of their pursuit echoed off the walls, getting closer. Desperation fueled me, my body moving on autopilot as I searched for an escape. Then I saw a glimmer of hope. A fire escape ladder, rusting but intact, leading up the side of an old brick building. I clambered onto it, ignoring the pain as the rough metal tore into my hands. Up and up I climbed, not daring to look down. Each rung was an agonizing step further from the horrors below. Just as I reached the roof, a hand shot out from the darkness snatching at my ankle. They had followed me up the ladder. I kicked out wildly, barely managing to break free as I hauled myself over the edge to safety. I lay on the cold, unforgiving concrete of the roof, gasping for air as I dragged myself away from the edge. They didn't follow. They just stood there, staring up at me with those vacant, glowing eyes. I stayed up there the rest of the night, huddling close to a vent for some warmth and watching those things down below. 
They just lingered there, unmoving, unwavering, until the first light of dawn started to creep over the horizon. That's when they finally vanished as if into thin air. I cautiously made my way down the fire escape, my body trembling with the aftershock of what had happened. I didn't want to go home, not back to my cabin up in the woods, but I was exhausted and too terrified to think straight. I walked back to my truck, the morning sun a cruel contrast to the night I had just endured. As soon as I got back to my place, I started packing. I didn't even try and rationalize it, just threw some clothes and supplies into a duffel bag and locked up the cabin. I needed to get as far away from Willow Creek as possible. News of the incident at the bar had already filtered up to me. They'd found the bartender dead. The rest, Ryland included, had simply vanished, no trace. That's how it goes in a town like this, people disappear. Whether it's accidents, logging mishaps, or something else, the woods always seem to claim a few. I told the cops what little I could. A fight broke out, my friends went missing. I didn't tell them about the creature in the trees, the eyes, the walker. They would have thrown me in a psych ward. And who could blame them? I'd barely believed it myself, but I knew, deep down, that I was lucky to be alive. I still don't know what those people turned into that night, what cursed this little backwoods town so terribly. All I know is that somewhere out there in the endless stretch of those redwoods, the walker still lurks. I hope that someday its name will be forgotten just another spooky story told around campfires. But for me, those glowing eyes in the darkness will haunt my nightmares until the day I die. I dug back on memory lane the other day trying to figure out the strangest thing that has ever happened to me. I'm Thaddeus, by the way, and I'll bet this one's a doozy. It was about a year ago, and I was hunting with my buddies in the back country of Idaho. We've got this tradition we do every fall. Four of us, Bryce, Rowan, Killian, and yours truly. We always get a little cabin rental way out a real off-the-grid kind of thing. Let's us connect man-to-man, -man, you know? This trip had been a bust so far. Nothing but scraggly, runty deer. Not even a good bear sighting. We were on like day three, starting to get that itch where you realize it's way more about the camaraderie than any actual trophies. Bryce is in this philosophical mood, ranting on about how much modern life alienates a guy from the real world. Rowan, that dude's always hungry, was rummaging in the snack bag, throwing peanut shells onto the floor. Me, I was bored enough to start cleaning my rifle, just as routine. Killian, he was quiet. He'd always been the stoic one in the group. I was gonna poke fun at him, you know, guy to guy. But then he stood up real sudden, went dead serious. I hear something out there, he says. Bryce lets out this groan. Chill, man, probably a squirrel or something. No, Killian's voice is low and focused. This is different. Big. Honestly, I started getting that prickle on my neck. Killian knows the woods better than any of us. So we grab our rifles, flashlights, those big, heavy-duty ones, and head outside. Now the whole mood changes. It was pretty late, that kind of dusk where it's not quite night, and there's just this, heaviness to the air. The quiet, though. Damn, you ever been in the woods where that quiet just hits different? Makes the hair on your arms stand up. We creep along the perimeter. Rifles at the ready, flashlights throwing long beams out into the dense forest. Rowan even whispers, Think it might be a mountain lion? My heart's doing a double-time stutter. We had this whole cougar awareness talk back at the ranger station when we got permits. 
big cats. That's a different sort of danger. Then I see it. Maybe ten yards off, just barely beyond the light, a pair of eyes reflecting back at us. Like nothing I've ever seen. Huge, but low to the ground, with this yellow glow that just kind of vibrates. I swear to God, for a second, I think someone's playing a sick prank. It ain't till the eyes blink, slow and deliberate, that the fear kicks in. What the hell is that? Bryce's voice is shaking almost as bad as mine. Before anyone can answer, this huge shape surges out of the darkness towards us. I don't even remember consciously deciding just reflex. I squeeze the trigger. BLAM. The recoil knocks me back. The gunshot echoes through the trees, and the thing lets out this howl that chills me to the bone. It ain't any animal I recognize a cry that's part pain, part rage. Killian's shouting something about not having a clear shot, and the sense kicks back in. I stumble back, rifle still clutched in my hands, eyes fixated on the darkness. Then I see them, two yellow orbs moving erratically, shifting, getting further apart. Splitting up! I yell. It's a desperate hope more than a deduction, but the lights separate. Now Rowan and Bryce are firing too, gunshots filling the night, their voices panicked. We fall back towards the cabin, heart pounding so loud I swear the damn thing can hear us. We slam the door behind us, throw the deadbolt for good measure. I'm shaking, adrenaline coursing through my veins like ice water. Bryce collapses against the door, sucking in deep breaths, his face a ghost pale shade. What the hell was that? He gasps out. None of us know. There's this stunned silence. Nobody wants to be the first to break it. I think back to those eyes, the unnatural glow, the low slung shape. Whatever it was out there, it wasn't just some misidentified bear. Killian breaks the quiet first. We gotta call this in. He fishes his phone out of his pocket, frowns. No signal out here. That sends another wave of terror through us. Bryce starts pacing. So what do we do? Just wait for morning? No way those things are gone. Rowan chimes in, his voice trembling. There's this growing certainty within me that they ain't going anywhere. That out there in the dark, we are prey. The cabin suddenly feels like a flimsy cage. I start to hear sounds then, scratching at the windows, low guttural snarls, like the damn things are out there, circling us. Killian heads decisively for the back room. Grab supplies, we're moving. His voice is the only reason we don't crumble. We start throwing stuff into backpacks. Food, water, ammo, whatever we can grab. We're scrambling, no real plan in mind. Rowan staring out the window, face white as a sheet. They're messing with us, he says in the small, broken voice. Circling, like they know. He's not wrong, I can sense the movement too now. My rifle shaking in my hands as I sweep it across the cabin windows. We need a plan, but my mind is a jumbled, panicked mess. I look desperately to Killian, like maybe this survivalist dude has some ace up his sleeve. Instead, his face is grim. We're gonna make a run for it. Bryce, take point. Rowan, you got the rear dash. He's laying out this plan, voice shaking but steady. Where to? Bryce cuts in, his voice high with fear. It's the question none of us want to answer. The dark woods beyond the cabin, the same woods with those unnatural eyes lurking in the shadows, seem more terrifying than staying put. The scratching gets louder, and from a corner window, I catch a flicker of movement. Too big for a raccoon, too sleek for a bear. My knees feel weak. Rowan suddenly screams from the back room. Panic crashes into me, 
I spin around, gun raised. One of those hellish glowing orbs is staring directly through the glass, so close I could almost reach out and touch it. There's a split second where we're locked, me and the creature. I can see it better now low, powerful body with dark matted fur. Its teeth are bared in a snarl, too long and sharp. It's massive, at least twice the size of any normal wolf or mountain lion. Bryce is yelling from the front door, and I realize we're wasting precious seconds. We gotta go! Now! Bryce's voice cracks with urgency. We break from the window, adrenaline pushing us into a frenzy. This can't be how it ends, trapped like rats in some horror movie cliché. There's a side door in the kitchen. I remember the layout from when we first got here. Killian's already leading the charge, his usually calm demeanor replaced by raw intensity. Into the trees, split up. Make them choose. His strategy cuts through my panic. A sliver of hope sparks. Maybe if we scatter, we can confuse them. We burst through the door, stumbling into the darkness. I sprint blindly, branches whipping at my face, the pounding of my own heart almost drowning out the sounds of the hunt behind me. I dare a glance back, see a flash of yellow cut through the darkness where Rowan was a second ago. A scream pierces the night, and my blood runs cold. Rowan's gone. I keep running, the taste of bile in my throat, and those glowing orbs seared into my brain. I don't know how long I stumble through the undergrowth. Minutes? Hours? It feels like an eternity, the fear twisting inside me like a barbed wire. Then I see it, a sliver of moonlight through the trees, the faint outline of a dirt road. The old fire service route, that's gotta lead somewhere. I push myself harder, a desperate surge of hope reigniting within me. If I can just get to the road, maybe there's a chance. Maybe there's help. I break through the tree lean, gasping for breath. Moonlight glints on a rusted car. Looks like a 70s pickup abandoned on the side of the road. For a split second, I feel stupid. Some beat-up truck ain't gonna save me from those beasts back there. Then I see it, on the dash of the truck, a CB radio. Old school, but they still work way out here where cell service drops dead. Hands shaking, I climb inside, fumble for the mic, and click it on. Hello, anyone out there, Mayday, we're under attack. My voice breaks with the strain, but I keep going. Location, description of the creatures, the urgency in my voice would be undeniable. Minutes drag on with no response. Nothing but static and my own panicked breaths. I'm about to give up when a crackly voice breaks through. Roger that, unidentified caller. Hold tight, ranger team inbound. Do not engage, repeat, do not engage. A wave of relief washes over me so intense I almost crumple. Rangers mean backup, guns, a fighting chance. I describe our last known location and the voice gives me instructions to sit tight and stay inside the truck. The wait is agonizing, my mind playing tricks on me. Every creak in the old truck, every rustle in the trees makes me jump. My grip tightens on my rifle. Finally, I hear them, tires crunching on gravel, the blue flash of the ranger truck's lights. They pull up, a man and woman hop out, Rifles in hand and flashlights sweeping the area. They're no bullshit, the kind of folks who've seen things out in the backcountry. I stumble out, hands up, practically yelling my story at them. They take us in, listen intently. I describe the glowing eyes, the hunt, Rowan. I struggle to keep my voice steady. The ranger who answered the call, his name's Tom, looks grim. Never heard nothing like that in these parts. But we take these calls seriously. They radio in a full search crew, 
and that's when it really sinks in. This isn't a bad nightmare, this is real. Dawn breaks as the search team fans out across the area. We join them, following them through the same woods that were our living hell just hours before. I search every thicket, eyes peeled for any sign of Rowan, of those damn yellow eyes gleaming in the undergrowth. We find nothing. Not a trace of Rowan, not a single, solitary footprint of those creatures. It's like they vanished into thin air. The search team finds evidence of disturbed branches, some matted fur caught on thorns but they write it off as bare activity. The rangers take our statements, their faces a mixture of concern and skepticism like they think we lost our marbles out there or were on a bad trip. Months pass. The official report comes back, animal attack, possibly aggravated bears. They say Rowan's remains were likely scavenged, leaving nothing behind. But I know, the others know, that story is full of holes. That ain't how bears act and that ain't no normal fur. We keep our mouths shut, though. Can't explain what we don't understand. Sometimes late at night, when the shadows stretch long, I think I catch a flicker of yellow from the corner of my eye. I convince myself it's nothing, just the headlights passing by or a trick of the light. But deep down, I know the truth. They're out there, still lurking, waiting. I've dug up old folklore, tales from the native tribes in the area about shapeshifters, skinwalkers. The name that sticks is Amrock, dire wolves of legend. Sounds crazy, but whatever attacked us, those ain't normal beasts. We carry that truth with us, a shadow that hangs over every hunting trip, every late night drive through the woods. Some scars don't show, but they cut the deepest. I spent last weekend with my friends at a lakeside cabin in the Adirondacks. Me, Aiden, Corban, and Brianna, we all grew up together in upstate New York. This getaway was Brianna's idea. She said we needed to reconnect after not seeing each other much since college. I was all in. The city grinds you down after a while. We rented a rustic two-story just off the water's edge. Old-growth trees framed the property, and the lake peeked through the dense branches. Perfect spot for some overdue catching up, fishing, and okay, maybe a few drinks too. This wasn't some spring break rager though. We're in our late twenties, getting into those early aches and pains you swear aren't signs of aging. Friday night we mostly just chilled by the fire pit, talking about old times. Corban and I had a good laugh about that eighth grade incident where Aiden got chased up a tree by a feral cat. Aiden swore revenge, but you wouldn't know it by his relaxed smile. The morning brought brilliant sunshine and enough warmth to make us strip down to shorts and t-shirts. It felt like a proper summer had finally arrived. We decided on a hike through the woods, following a trail that wound along the lake and deep into the forest. With Aiden navigating and Brianna leading the way, we set off. The trail wound deeper and deeper. We joked about Brianna taking us on a horror movie adventure. Corban pretended to be scared, which made Brianna and I roll our eyes. I'm not gonna lie, the woods took on a kind of eerie feeling the further we went. The trees grew insanely tall, blocking out sunlight. Even the chirpy squirrels and birds went quiet. We should have listened to that uneasy feeling. Corban was a few paces ahead when he turned to us. You hear that? We all froze. At first, nothing but the wind rustling through leaves, then a crackle in the brush just off the trail. I saw Brianna tense up, her eyes scanning the undergrowth. From somewhere in the shadows, something made a low, guttural moan that chilled me to the bone. Aiden whispered, What the hell is that? 
Time to get the heck out of here, Corban suggested. I didn't disagree, but before we could turn, a creature I can't fully describe burst from the trees. It was immense, like a bear, but too long and lanky. Shaggy black fur matted in clumps, revealing patches of raw, mottled skin. Its face was wrong. Too elongated, with a snout jutting outward filled with jagged, yellow teeth. Brianna screamed, like a proper blood-curdling scream. It launched itself at her, knocking her to the ground. Corban and I exchanged a panicked look, then he shouted, Brianna, get up! Aiden bolted forward, throwing a rock at the creature. I think it startled the thing enough to stop its attack for a second. That gave Brianna the time to scramble to her feet. We all backed away slowly, eyes glued to the monstrosity. It paced in a half-circle in front of us, sniffing the air, its eyes. Those eyes were unsettling. Not an animal's eyes, there was something intelligent, hungry behind them. Aiden was yelling, What are we gonna do? I was too shaken up to think clearly. My mind raced back to stories I'd heard from my uncle about wild animals gone rabid. Could this be that? I didn't know, but my gut said, Run! Yet something about the way the creature watched us made me doubt we could outrun it. We were like prey paralyzed in its gaze. The thing took a step forward, and that snapped me out of my trance. Go! Now! I grabbed Brianna's arm, pulling her as Corban and Aiden flanked us. We tore down the path, half running, half stumbling. I expected the creature to be right behind us, but all I heard were rustling leaves and those ragged, guttural breaths growing fainter. We didn't stop till we saw the cabin through the trees. Bursting into the familiar clearing felt like reaching an oasis. I collapsed onto the porch. Brianna beside me, gasping for breath. That was... Aiden panted, leaning against a post. I don't... Okay, okay, we're safe now. Corban tried to sound reassuring, even though his hands were shaking. Brianna stared at the tree line, eyes wide with a terror I mirrored. What was that thing? Nobody answered. It wasn't a bear, not a wolf not anything I'd ever seen before. I glanced at the others. They seemed just as bewildered as I felt. There was a heavy silence, the only sound a panicked woodpecker drilling into a nearby tree. We called the sheriff and relayed everything. He seemed skeptical, of course, but promised to send over a ranger to check the area. To our surprise, they called back about an hour later. We found some tracks— the sheriff said, his voice no longer dismissive. And well, they sure ain't from any animal I recognize. I looked at my friends. Their faces held the same mix of confusion and unease I felt. The sheriff assured us he'd keep an eye out, and we hung up. We hadn't even gone back outside, no way after what we'd seen. Instead, we huddled in the living room and tried to process what the hell had just happened. As the sun began to set, we decided to head back to the city. The weekend was definitely on hold. Something about the darkening woods outside sent shivers down my spine. I'd grown up in this area, spent countless hours playing in the forests, but now it felt alien, as if there were things lurking just beyond the visible things we weren't meant to see. Since then, I've been plagued by a sense of wrongness. Like we stumbled onto something best left undiscovered. All I can think about is the moment that creature pinned its unsettling gaze on us, the intelligent hunger in its eyes. What was it? What did it want with us? Brianna keeps calling to check in. She swears she sees things out of the corner of her eye fleeting shadows that disappear when she turns her head. Corban says he's fine, but I can hear it in his voice, the strain he's trying to hide. 
Me? I don't know how to feel fine anymore. Part of me wishes we could just forget the whole damn thing. But how do you forget something like that? I can't shake the image of it. That elongated face, those hungry eyes. People don't believe us, of course. The photos from our hike turned out blurry, useless. Brianna swore she saw the creature again lurking at the edge of the woods near her apartment complex. Corban and Aiden, they keep their distance. I think they just want to put the whole weekend behind them, pretend it was some trick of the light, a mass hallucination. But I know what I saw. In the weeks after, I scoured the internet for clues. Old folk tales, local legends, anything. My sleep became a nightmare parade of fanged faces and guttural snarls. I was exhausted but terrified of closing my eyes, knowing that thing might be waiting in the shadows. It felt like a curse settling over me. Then I found a reference to the shriek. An illustration in a faded, digitized volume of folklore depicted a creature startlingly similar to what we encountered. The description matched, the lanky limbs, the black patchy fur, the chilling moan. According to the lore, it was a creature of malevolent intent, feeding off fear and misery. Suddenly, things started to make a horrifying kind of sense. That realization fueled me. I couldn't just hide from this thing. I couldn't let it go on haunting us, or who knows, hurting someone else. Brianna seemed the most receptive to my crazy theory, probably due to her own encounters. Together, we delved deeper into the lore of the Shriek and discovered that it could supposedly be banished by fire and iron, ancient tools for warding off evil. Armed with this sliver of hope, a mix of fear and determination surged through me. I found an old, beaten-up hunting rifle in my dad's attic. It needed a good cleaning. The barrel was rusty, but it seemed functional. I bought ammo, heavy slugs for maximum impact, and spent an afternoon at the range teaching myself the basics. Every shot pounded against my shoulder, but the recoil felt strangely satisfying, a sign I was ready to fight back. Brianna and I decided to make our stand back at the cabin, we hoped the familiarity of the place might lure the creature out, and there were woods all around for cover and escape if needed. If we failed, well, I didn't want to think about that. At the cabin, we rigged the porch with crude traps, fishing line and old tin cans for a makeshift alarm. We laid out iron tools from the shed, a saw, a hammer, even a rusty poker in front of the fireplace. The setting sun cast long shadows across the clearing, and every creaking floorboard, every distant snap of a branch, set my heart racing. Brianna sat with her back to the fireplace, clutching a kitchen knife for all the good it would do. I was by the window with eyes glued to the trees, rifle raised, but my hands were shaking. The hours stretched into an agonizing blend of dread and the sick fascination of waiting for your executioner. The alarm went off just before midnight. We both jumped, my stomach twisting. Peering out the window, I saw it, a slinking shape emerging from the tree line, the patchy fur almost glowing in the pale moonlight. The shriek was back. Here it comes! I shouted to Brianna my heart pounding a frantic rhythm. I braced and fired, the blast echoing through the night. The creature howled, a piercing sound that scraped against my ears, but didn't fall. It was wounded, but angry. It charged the porch, crashing through our pathetic traps. I fired again and again, the rifle bucking in my hands. One of my shots hit home, and the creature snarled in pain. Brianna was screaming as it lunged. And then, fire. Brianna flung the burning logs from the fireplace onto the creature, and its coarse fur caught alight. It howled again, a shriek that seemed to cut the very air. Writhing, 
it stumbled and crashed back into the darkness of the trees. We stood there panting, staring into the night. Had we done it? The shriek didn't return. We waited until sunrise, a tense, sleepless vigil broken only by the twittering of oblivious birds. Finally, we cautiously ventured out, following the trail of blood and burned brush into the woods. We never found a body, but the trail simply ended in a clearing. It vanished. Since then, the sighting stopped. No more screams echoed from the woods. The shriek was gone, banished, or maybe dead. Brianna, she moved out of the city, bought a plot of land upstate. Says she needed the quiet, needed to mend her spirit. Corban and Aiden, they never fully recovered. They avoid me now, like I'm a reminder of the darkness they want to forget. As for me, I don't sleep much these days. There's a lingering ache in my soul, a deep well of unsettled fear. But there's also a sliver of grim satisfaction. I stared into the abyss, and I didn't blink. I fought back. And maybe, just maybe, there's still a corner of the world where the shadows don't touch. I always figured folks up in northern Washington were kinda off, you know. That whole backwoods cult vibe runs strong out there. Honestly, I should have known better than to accept that logging job, especially that far into the wilderness. I'm Rian, by the way, and I swear, what I'm about to tell you might sound crazy, but every word of it's the God's honest truth. First day on sight, I'm getting the lay of the land from the foreman a grizzled old bastard named Hethcote. Dude had one eye, the other hidden behind a nasty old patch, and not a single tooth in his head that I could see. Anyway, he takes me out to the furthest part of the logging area, points to this patch of massive pines and says, See those there? Don't touch em. Naturally, me being me, I ask. Why the hell not? Hethcote spits some brown gunk on the ground. Old growth. Sacred or some such nonsense. Companies got an agreement with the locals. I raise an eyebrow. Locals? We're miles from anything resembling a town. That's when he gives me the one-eyed stare, and even though the sun's beating down, I swear I feel a chill. Don't mean there ain't folks living out here, boy. Now you listen good. Them trees stay or else. He doesn't finish, but the way his voice lowers, I get the message loud and clear. Something about this whole setup feels hinky, but hey, a job's a job, and I'm not one to argue with a paycheck. Plus, I've got a healthy dose of morbid curiosity. First few weeks, things go about as smoothly as you'd expect for logging. The work's tough, the bugs are monstrous, and the crew's a bunch of roughnecks with even rougher personalities. There's Silas, built like a bear who never stops grumbling, and twins, Finn and Bran, who barely talk but give me the creeps with their silent stares. We keep a wide berth from the sacred trees, but there's this weird energy in the air around them. Like the forest itself is holding its breath. Even the birds seem to avoid that area. Me, I'm not much for superstitious crap, but you spend enough time in the woods, you start noticing things. The shadows seem a little deeper, the wind a little colder. Then comes the night it all goes to hell. I'm on late shift, running equipment near the forbidden zone. It's close to midnight, and everyone else has turned in. Now, I ain't one to spook easy, but there's something about being alone in those woods at night that sets your nerves on edge. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves, makes you jump. I'm about to call it quits when I hear it, a low, guttural growl from the direction of the sacred pines. It's not an animal I recognize. 
Hell, it almost sounds human. I freeze, heart pounding. Another growl, closer this time, and a prickling sensation crawls down my spine. Some primal part of my brain screams at me to run, but instead, like a damn fool, I switch off the machine and grab my flashlight. Bad move, Rian. Real bad move. The second I step into the shadows, the smell hits me. Like rotting meat and something sickeningly sweet underneath. My stomach turns, and I almost gag, but I force myself forward. The beam of my flashlight cuts through the gloom, and that's when I see it. At first, my brain refuses to process it. Standing hunched between two of the giant trees is this thing. Tall, way taller than any man, with long, gangly limbs that end in claws. Its back is to me, covered in what looks like rough, bark-like skin, all knots and protrusions. But it's the head that sends me reeling back. Twisted, elongated, with a gaping maw filled with rows of needle-sharp teeth. And antlers, massive, gnarled things pushing from its skull like some kind of demonic crown. For a terrifying moment, it seems unaware of me, its head tilted to the side as if listening to something only it can hear. Then, slowly, it turns. I don't remember screaming, don't remember fumbling for the equipment controls, but somehow I manage to get the machine roaring to life. The creature whips around, startled, and that's my cue to get the hell out of there. Branches snap and whip against my vehicle as I tear through the undergrowth, the guttural roars echoing behind me. I don't stop until I reach camp, burst into the barracks, and start yelling like a man-man. Silas and the twins look at me like I've grown a second head, but Hethkit, he just stares for a long moment, that one good I calculating. You saw it, didn't you? He finally rasps. Saw what? Silas bellows. The hell's he talking about? Hethkid ignores him, his gaze fixed on me. The Guardian. My mouth goes dry. I knew it. I freaking knew those trees weren't off limits for nothing. But before I can ask, before any of them can say another word, a blood curdling shriek cuts through the night. It's coming from the woods. Hethkit's already grabbing his rifle, the rest of the crew scrambling to arm themselves. Another scream, closer this time, followed by a sound I'll never forget, the wet crunch of bone and the desperate, gurgling cries of a man cut short. Marty, Finn whispers, his face pale. Silas roars in fury, charging out the door without a second thought. The twins follow, Hethkid barking orders behind them. Me? Well, I should run. Hell, any sane person would run. But something about that unholy scream, it awakens something dark and reckless within me. Before I can fully think it through, I'm grabbing an axe from the tool shed, my heart a frantic drumbeat in my chest. I know I'm walking into a nightmare, but I can't just sit here while that. That thing tears my crewmates apart. I plunge into the night, the axe heavy in my hands, the fading screams my only guide. The forest seems to close in around me, the shadows alive with unseen horrors. My flashlight's beam barely pierces the gloom, and every rustle, every snap sets me on edge. Up ahead, I see the flicker of flashlights and hear muffled shouts. As I draw nearer, the scene unfolds before me like some grotesque tableau. Marty's body lies twisted at the base of a tree, his chest a mangled ruin. A few yards away, Silas is locked in a desperate struggle with the creature. Its claws rake across his back, drawing deep, bloody gashes, and Silas can barely keep his rifle trained on it. The twins are circling, trying to get a clear shot but the damn thing's too fast, weaving in and out of the shadows like a phantom. Hethkit's barking orders, but the crew's in disarray. That's when the creature sees me. 
Its head snaps in my direction, those impossible antlers silhouetted against the moonlight. For a split second, we lock eyes, and I swear there's an intelligence in its gaze that chills me to the bone. It doesn't feel like an animal, not fully. It's something, older, more calculating. With a snarl that sends shivers down my spine, the creature abandons Silas and lunges for me. Pure terror surges through me, and instinct takes over. I don't even think, just roar and charge, swinging the axe with every ounce of strength I've got. The creature hisses in surprise, leaping out of the way as my axe bites into thin air. This gives Silas a lifeline. He scrambles back, firing his rifle wildly. One shot hits the creature in the shoulder, making it stagger. Another grazes its leg, and it howls in pain and rage. Run, Rian, get out of here! Silas yells at me, his voice strained. But some damn stubborn part of me refuses. I see Finn on the ground, clutching his wounded arm. Brands firing desperately, trying to cover him, but the creature is just too damn fast. With a flicker of movement impossible for its size, it's on Bran, those awful claws sinking into his side. I see red. With a feral scream, I charge again. I'm vaguely aware of Hethgut shouting something, but all I can hear is the roar of blood in my ears. I slam into the creature, sending it stumbling. It lashes out, catching me across the chest. Pain explodes like fire down my torso, but I ignore it, swinging again, again, each blow fueled by a desperate, burning anger. I don't know how long it lasts. Seconds that stretch into an eternity. My axe cleaves through the creature's leathery skin, drawing spatters of black, foul-smelling blood. It screeches, stumbles, and then, with a final desperate heave, I land a blow squarely on its twisted skull. There's a sickening crack, and the creature sags, falling to its knees. I raise the axe for a final, killing strike, but Hethkit is suddenly beside me, gripping my arm. Hold on, boy, he rasps, his one eye gleaming. It ain't dead yet. He points to the creature. It's twitching, the gnarled antlers drooping, but it's still breathing. Hethkit pulls a flask from his pocket and unscrews the cap. Drink up, Rian, he orders, shoving the flask towards me. This'll make it easy. I take a swig. It burns going down, some liquor I don't recognize mixed with a bitter edge I can't place. Reluctantly, I hand the flask back to Hethkit. He steps up to the creature, which tries feebly to lift its head. With a swift, almost gentle motion, Hethkit pours the rest of the liquid down its throat. The creature convulses and then goes completely still. We stand in heavy silence, the only sounds the rasp of our own labored breathing and the fading echo of the creature's death throws. Finally, Hethkit breaks the stillness. Well, that's taken care of, he says, his voice grim. Silas spits on the ground. Damn near killed us all. Should have listened to ya, Hethkit. Finn limps over, clutching his injured arm. He looks pale, but there's a fierce glint in his eyes. What the hell was that thing? He asks. Hethkit tucks the flask away. Folks around here call it the skin taker. Guardian of the old ways, he says quietly. We made a deal with those old ways a long time ago. Brand croaks from where he lies, his face white with pain. Hethcote sighs. Times change. Guess those old ways were getting restless. He looks at us then, at the fallen bodies of the creature and Marty, and something heavy shadows his remaining eye. We can't keep quiet about this. Police gotta know. But... He raises his voice, a commanding note replacing the weariness. Anyone asks, it was a bear attack. A big one. You hear me? 
We all nod, too exhausted to argue. Even Bran manages a week. Got it. The next few days are a blur. The authorities come, gruff men in uniforms who view the scene with a mix of skepticism and unease. Our story, sanitized and streamlined, raises more questions than answers. There are hushed conversations about animal attacks, conservation laws being broken, the normal explanations that folks cling to when reality gets too damn strange. We stick to our story, do our best to bury the true horror of that night under layers of bear attacks and tragic accidents. The logging job gets shut down, company offering some paltry compensation to shut us up. Silas grumbles about it, but the rest of us, we just want to leave this whole mess behind. I spend a week in the hospital, patched up and given enough painkillers to knock out a horse. The gashes across my chest will leave nasty scars, a permanent reminder of that night. But it's the psychological wounds that cut deeper, the nightmares vivid even in waking hours. Afterward, the crew drifts apart. Silas heads up north. The twins disappear back into the shadows from whence they came. I hear Hethcote stays stubborn as ever, out there on the edge of the wilderness, watching and waiting. As for me, I head as far away from Washington as I can manage. Now I work at a gas station in a dusty corner of Arizona. It ain't glamorous, but it's quiet. I still jump at sudden noises, still jolt awake in a cold sweat, but the nightmares are fading, slowly. Some nights, though, when the wind rustles the desert scrub just right, I swear I hear a guttural snarl echoing in the distance, and the hair on the back of my neck stands straight up. I spent most of my summers growing up hiking with my dad in the Appalachian Mountains. We tackled trails in West Virginia, Tennessee, sometimes even down in Georgia. My name's Emery Finnegan, and I always looked forward to those trips. I'd be sweating like a dog under the hot August sun, my dad striding out ahead, but the views at those high spots were incredible. This past July... I decided that it was time to go someplace new and hit up a trail I'd never been on before, the Lost Mine Trail up in Oregon. I'd never traveled out west, so part of the draw was seeing a completely different landscape. Packed a bag, booked a flight, and made my way to Portland. The drive from there to the trailhead was about two hours, a mix of busy highways and smaller quieter roads that cut through rolling farmlands. The trailhead was easy enough to find, thankfully. It's a popular one, even though it's fairly remote. When I got there, late in the afternoon, the parking lot was still jammed with cars. I felt a little twinge of annoyance. I'd hoped for more solitude. But hey, the hike itself was advertised as challenging, with a decent bit of elevation gain. Maybe people would bail after the first steep bit. I got my pack out, plenty of water, trail mix, my usual supplies, and shouldered it. Okay, time to see what's so special about this lost mine trail. The first mile or so was tough, but nothing insane. Steep incline, switchbacks, all the stuff you expect. The trees were incredible, though, giants with thick, mossy trunks. The forest felt ancient, sunlight filtering through the high branches. After a while, folks started thinning out. Some families pushing double strollers turned back. A couple of guys with day packs grumbled about the elevation. I pushed on, the trail a thin, dirt line through the thick woods. Then I hit a weird spot. The trail just widened. No sign explaining why, just a patch of dirt instead of a path. Okay, maybe a washout, I thought. I stepped out into the clearing, squinting up at the sun breaking through the canopy. 
Something rustled in the bushes up ahead. A deer, I guessed. Didn't pay it much mind. I took one more step out of the tree line, and then I saw it, clear as day. Maybe twenty yards in front of me, a creature stood hunched over, digging at the ground with long, bony fingers. I froze. I'd been on enough hikes to know a bear when I saw one, and this wasn't it. Too tall, too thin, the limbs were wrong, in a way I can't quite explain. It was covered in a pale, furless hide with a pattern of dark, raised veins. The head, it was huge and bald, like a misshapen egg, with two dark, recessed eyes. I'd heard the stories of Bigfoot and all, folks claiming to spot things out in the woods. But I never believed a word of it. Now, looking at this thing, I was starting to reconsider. My breath hitched in my throat, but I was frozen in place. Then, with a sickening crack, it straightened up. I saw, clear as day, a half-eaten deer carcass clutched in its hands. I don't know if it saw me or not. I don't know if it knew there was an easy meal a few yards away. All I know is that there was something in the way those dark eyes settled on me, and suddenly I could move again. I turned and ran, not even caring where the trail was, just bolting back through the dense trees. Branches snagged my pack, my shirt, but I didn't look back until I burst back through that gap in the tree line and onto the proper path. My lungs were burning, my heart jackhammering in my chest. I scrambled up the trail a ways before stopping to catch my breath and look around. The clearing where I'd seen the creature was empty. There was no sign of it anywhere. Had I imagined it all? I looked down at my hands, still shaking. Those dark eyes, that cracked open deer, no, it had been real, as real as I was standing there. I waited a while, unsure of what to do. Part of me, the stupid, adventurous part, wanted to sneak back. Get a picture, something to prove it. But the bigger part of me screamed to run. I listened to that voice. I turned and ran, backtracking down the trail. I ran all the way to the parking lot, where my car was waiting, a comforting piece of the normal world. I climbed inside, slammed the door shut, and locked it. My hands were still shaking as I started the engine and pulled out onto the road. I didn't stop driving until I was well clear of those mountains, speeding down the highway. It wasn't until I checked into a motel off the interstate that I felt safe enough to dig out my phone. I looked up the Lost Mine Trail, and sure enough, there were stories. Scattered accounts just like mine, people catching glimpses of a tall, thin, pale creature out in the woods. Some even claimed to have seen it, well, eating things it shouldn't. I left a review too, my hands shaking as I typed. It felt like a warning, one that folks could ignore if they wanted. I did my best to put it behind me. I flew back home, tried to get back to my normal routine. But at night, lying in my safe bed, I can still see the empty clearing, the trees, and the impossibly long limbs of that creature reaching for something on the ground. I still hear the snap of the deer's bones. The Lost Mine Trail is still open for hiking. You can go there if you want. But as for me, I think those Oregon woods are going to have to do without Emery Finnegan for a very, very long time. Maybe for good. I always loved exploring the backwoods of Kentucky. My buddies, Riker and Lachlan, and I called ourselves the Bourbon Trifecta. We'd been friends our whole lives, and some of our happiest times were out on the trails around Lexington. So, one late fall afternoon the year we turned twenty-eight, we decided to head for a patch of old-growth forest near an old limestone quarry. 
The place always had a bit of an eerie feel to it, which I guess made it all the more exciting. Lachlan brought his fancy camera gear, ready to snap some artsy shots of the changing leaves. Riker, true to his nature, had a hip flask full of his grandpappy's moonshine, probably not the greatest thing to hike with on those rocky slopes. But that was Riker. The sun dipped pretty low as we made our way along the path, so the quarry was in full-on creepy mode by the time we reached its mossy rim. You know that feeling when it's almost pitch black, and you're hyper-focused only on what your headlamp picks up. We fumbled around for a bit, making stupid jokes to mask the prickling on our necks. Riker took a big swig from his flask and coughed. Well, boys, I'm getting the vibe that maybe it's beer o'clock. We got any left? Lachlan set his backpack down with a clatter, rustling through his bag. I think there are a couple back at the car. Not really in the mood to hike back. As they went back and forth about whether to brave the trail in the dark, I heard something I couldn't shake, like a snuffling sound. I stopped, holding up my hand for quiet. Whoa, hold up, Carter. You hearing things again? Riker chuckled, but even in the dim light, I saw a trace of nervousness on his face. Hey, it's just, listen. I cocked my head. It was faint, but definitely there. A rhythmic thudding mixed with a weird, wheezing sound. It wasn't like any animal I knew. Ah, man, not this again. Lachlan groaned. You got me all paranoid now. Let's get out of here. They took off down the trail, toward the safety of the car, and whatever meager light came from a parking lot. I hesitated. That sound, it was coming from the woods on the far side of the quarry. I was a curious guy, okay. My buddies might call me recklessly curious. Whatever this weird thing was, I had to see it. I'll be right behind you guys, I called out. Just need to take a leak. Yeah, yeah, I know. Classic horror movie mistake, splitting up. But the way I figured it, I knew these woods, I was the best climber of the bunch, and if something went south, I could get the high ground fast. Plus, there was some weird, morbid fascination pulling me toward the noise. Taking a deep breath to shake off that prickling fear in my gut, I turned off my headlamp and crept toward the sound. The darkness was thick, but the tree trunks and rocks were familiar enough to make out as shapes against the dim sky. Closer and closer, guided by the wheezing and those strange, heavy thumps. At first, all I saw were dense shadows and the occasional glint of moonlight on the wet shale. But then I froze, stomach lurching. Maybe thirty feet ahead of me, I saw movement. I didn't even dare breathe. The silhouette was large, hunched, shifting against the trees. I strained my eyes to make sense of the shape, but it was too dark, too weirdly proportioned. All I could tell was that it wasn't an animal I'd ever seen. My heart began to thump almost as loud as the mysterious creature. Then I did the most stupid, impulsive, and possibly fatal thing of my life. Taking a shaky breath, I flipped my headlamp back on. It threw a small, sharp circle of light, illuminating a scene that made me wish I'd stayed in the blessed dark. Because this thing wasn't just bizarre, it was horrifying. Its body was massive, with rough, dark skin that looked as wrinkled as elephant hide. Its limbs were far too long and bent at odd angles, ending in huge clawed hands. But the worst part was its head. The long, wrinkled, vaguely dog-like face had too many teeth shoved into its wide jaws. And its eyes were what still give me nightmares, oversized, pure black orbs that seemed to soak up the light rather than reflect it. The thudding sound had stopped. The creature crouched, as still as if it was made of rock. But those terrible eyes were fixed on me. 
For a few endless seconds, we stared at each other, both frozen. I knew, deep down, that my survival odds weren't great with this thing blocking my only route back to the path. Finally, a sound broke the silence, not from the creature, but from the direction of the quarry rim. Carter! Riker's voice echoed in the still night. What the hell is going on down there? The monster's head whipped toward the quarry in a disturbingly fluid motion. That moment of distraction was my chance. I didn't waste it. Pivoting on my heel, I ran. Not in any sensible direction, just blindly through the trees, crashing through underbrush and slipping on the loose stones. I barely dared to look back. But the sound of crunching leaves and snapped twigs behind me confirmed the creature was on the move. My lungs burned, and a stitch stabbed in my side, but I didn't let up. I knew every dip and jut of rock in this area, and I was praying for some advantage to appear in the darkness. I scrambled up a steep slope, hoping the monster's clumsy-looking gait would slow it down. Suddenly, I saw it, a sheer drop, leading down to a disused mining track. It was a risky chance, but anything had to be better than being cornered. Reaching the edge, I peered down. It was about a twenty-foot descent, the bottom barely visible through the shadows. Behind me, I could hear it lumbering closer. I couldn't wait any longer. Bracing myself, I leaned forward and let myself freefall. I landed badly on the gravel, rolling to absorb the impact. A wave of pain shot up my ankle. I bit back a yell. I had to keep moving. Ignoring the throbbing pain, I sprinted along the dusty old track. The quarry had to be close at this point. Up ahead, a flicker of light. I rounded a bend and stumbled, blinking against sudden brightness. The quarry's parking lot, and blessed sight, Riker and Lachlan waving flashlights, their faces tight with panic. Carter! Over here! Lachlan yelled beckoning frantically. I ran faster than I thought my battered body could go. I was nearly there, almost to safety, when I felt an impact at the back of my knees. The creature had lunged, its long arms sweeping me off my feet. I hit the ground hard, gasping. As I scrambled desperately to stand, I saw it looming above me. An inhuman, rasping growl echoed through the night and its terrible claws raked at the open air. I was cornered. There was nowhere left to run. It lifted one massive paw, ready to strike. And then, like some weird fever dream, Riker emerged from the darkness, his voice booming through the stillness. Get the hell away from my friend, you freak! He must have been fueled by pure adrenaline and a generous slug of moonshine because he ran straight at the creature, shouting like a damn lunatic. Lachlan hesitated for less than a second, then joined in the madness with a guttural battle cry. The sudden charge must have rattled the creature, because it paused, its massive head swiveled in confusion between the two charging idiots. I took advantage of the beast's hesitation and scrambled back, my ankle burning, tears streaming down my face. Riker and Lachlan were upon the creature, shouting, flailing, doing very little actual damage, but providing the perfect distraction. It snapped back and forth, its growls shaking the air. Then, just as suddenly as it appeared, it turned tail and lumbered off into the dark trees. Riker and Lachlan froze, panting. They looked from me to the vanishing shape of the monster, then back at each other. Um, Carter, you seein' what we seein'? Lachlan stammered, his voice a few octaves higher than normal. My chest heaved with ragged breaths. The pain in my ankle was a dull roar, and I could already feel it swelling inside my boot. But I couldn't focus on that now. I stumbled over to Riker and Lachlan, who looked shocked into silence. 
Finally, Riker choked out. What the hell was that? I shook my head, trying to process it all. I don't know. But we need to get the hell out of here. We hobbled back toward the car, every crack of a twig sounding like the creature returning. I kept expecting it to lurch out of the darkness, but somehow we made it back to Riker's beat-up truck without another encounter. Lachlan fumbled with the keys, and we bundled inside, slamming the doors shut just as the dim twilight gave way to full darkness. The drive home was silent. When I looked over at Riker, I noticed that his knuckles were white on the steering wheel. Nobody asked stupid questions like, Are you sure you saw that right, Carter? Or, Maybe it was just an animal. Deep down, we all knew what was out there. When we reached my place, I managed to limp inside with their help. Riker pulled out a bottle of whiskey from his truck no more jokes about Grandpappy's moonshine this time. We drank and stared into the fire, lost in our own thoughts. The next few days were a blur of confusion and adrenaline comedowns. We didn't dare go to the cops who would believe us. We didn't even tell our families, figuring they'd worry more than they'd help. But the truth was, we were scared witless. One night, fueled by several shots of liquid courage, I dug into the weird side of the internet, hoping for a clue, a story anything to make sense of what happened. I found plenty of creepy tales lurking in the dark corners of Reddit, and old message boards, Bigfoot sightings, skinwalkers, all sorts of bizarre creatures in the shadows. It was comforting, in a way, knowing that somewhere out there were people who believed the unbelievable. That's when I stumbled across an old Appalachian folktale about the Scarpa shadowy, dog-like creature that walked the woods at night, preying on the lost and the reckless. The description fit the thing I'd seen almost perfectly, from its loping gait to the terrifying black eyes. It was enough to convince me that whatever was out there, it wasn't alone, which was hardly a reassuring thought. I showed Riker and Lachlan my findings, and it only fueled our anxieties. We started keeping watch, arming ourselves with whatever came to hand. I felt a pit of dread every time I set foot outside my house, knowing the Kentucky woods weren't just woods anymore. They were a hunting ground. That constant tension wore on us. Riker started drinking more and got into a couple of bar fights. We stopped hanging out as much, preferring to hide out in our own houses, trying to convince ourselves we were safer that way. But the truth was, we weren't safe. Not as long as that thing was out there. One rainy autumn night, about two months after the attack, Lachlan didn't come home. His wife called frantically, saying he never arrived after work like he usually did. We spent all night searching for him, driving the back roads, our hearts pounding with each rustling leaf. When they found his truck, overturned in a ravine, with blood and strange scratches marring the wreckage, it felt like all the air had been sucked out of the world. We knew, even though no body was ever recovered, that the Scarpa had claimed another victim. Lachlan's death was a breaking point. Riker packed up his truck the next day and disappeared, heading west, vowing never to look back. Nobody blamed him, least of all me. I stayed. It became some sort of twisted obsession. I wanted to know what I was dealing with. I studied wilderness survival like it was my final exam. I became an expert on the woods where the Scarpa roamed, its hunting grounds, my battleground. I got firearms, traps, night vision cameras enough gear to make me feel like a half-crazed hermit. Some nights, I'd venture out, setting myself as bait. I never slept soundly, always listening for that wheezing breath and the crunching of leaves. Years went by like this. I had a few close calls, saw the Scarpa from a distance on a couple occasions. It was like a twisted ghost story come to life. 
and then, one crisp fall morning, I found it caught in one of my snares. It was just as horrifying up close, a tangled mass of dark fur and sinewy limbs. Rage surged through me, a fire stoked by years of fear and grief over Lachlan. I raised my rifle and put a bullet right between those demonic black eyes. There was no big celebration, no sense of triumph. Mostly, I felt drained, exhausted. I dragged the carcass back to my land and burned it on a pyre that blazed for days. In some twisted way, it felt like laying Lachlan to rest. People in town started whispering about me after that, the crazy old carter who haunted the woods. I didn't care. I knew the truth of what lurked in the shadows. And I knew better than anyone the cost of venturing too deep into the dark. I spent some time last weekend at my buddy's cabin up in the woods of rural Idaho. You guys know Jerome, right? Well, anyway, Jerome's the kind of guy who never leaves the city, but he'd recently inherited this place from an estranged uncle. Some dusty, old cabin on a tiny patch of land in the middle of nowhere. Being Jerome, he wasn't eager to keep it, but he figured he could at least try to flip it for a quick profit. Since I was getting cabin fever and Jerome's a terrible driver— I convinced him to make a road trip out of it and check out the property. We left early Saturday morning, figuring we'd be back late that night. Not a long commute, even with Jerome's white-knuckle driving. If we could find a buyer quickly, we'd even hit a brewery on the way home. Win-win. The road snakes through the mountains, and after a couple of hours, we turned onto a rutted dirt track. The old pickup bounced like a jackhammer, and Jerome cursed nonstop. He kept complaining that the GPS was acting funny, but that felt like his usual excuse for missing the right exits. By the time we found the cabin, it was already mid-afternoon, and that mountain sun was about to set. The cabin itself was, well, it was something out of a horror movie. Rotted wood, busted windows— the whole shebang. Jerome immediately swore he wasn't staying the night, but I pointed out his fear of the dark and reminded him we had nowhere else to go. Now, I don't believe in ghosts or any of that spooky stuff, but even I felt an unease about the place. It wasn't just the disrepair, there was just something off. The woods around us felt too silent, like everything was holding its breath, watching us. All right, all right, let's get this over with. Jerome grunted, finally stepping out of the truck. Even in the fading light, his face was pale and clammy. The front door creaked open like a coffin lid, and we stepped inside. Dust flew into the setting sunlight, thick enough to see. I fumbled with my phone flashlight, but Jerome, for all his city bluster, had already brought a beefy camping lantern. He held it up, and we looked around. And yeah, it was as bad as we thought. Holes in the floor, water-stained ceilings, and the faint, musty smell of animal droppings. My guess? Squatters, both the human and furry kind. I'm gonna go scope out the grounds. You secure the perimeter— Jerome instructed in his most serious voice. I rolled my eyes. What are you expecting, Jerome? Axe murderers? A demonic bear? His laughter was too strained, and he was gone. I took a deep breath and started moving from room to room. It was just as dismal everywhere. But here's the thing under all the dust and grime. There was something else. Odd marks scratched into the walls, almost like claw marks. And every so often, I swear I'd hear a soft rustling from the ceiling, like something was up there. I made my way to the last room, a small, windowless space at the back. 
My flashlight cut through the gloom, landing on what looked like a pile of rags in the corner. Wait, those weren't rags. They were feathers. Big, coarse feathers. My gut twisted. Were there owls squatting here? Eagles? Then I heard it. A hiss. Low and menacing. Not from the ceiling, but from behind me. I froze. My fingers fumbled from my phone, and I spun. In the doorway, framed by the fading light, was a creature. No, that's not quite right. It seemed like a creature, hunched and vaguely humanoid. But it was wrong. Too tall, too thin, and its movements were all jerking and unnatural. Its skin, well, that's the hardest to describe. It seemed to change with every flicker of light. Smooth one second, then scaly, then bristly like fur. And its face. If it had a face. There was just this mottled expanse, almost like unfinished clay. Two dark halls might have been eyes, but I couldn't tell. My mind froze. I couldn't even scream. This thing twitched towards me, then lunged. It was too fast, too inhuman. I tried to dodge, but my legs were frozen. Something slammed into my shoulder, knocking me against the far wall. I slammed my head into the decaying wood and my vision blurred. The last thing I saw was that impossible shape, its darkness blotted out by a flash of white. Jerome's face popped into view. He was screaming my name. Behind you, he yelled. I scrambled to my feet. Something moved in the doorway, a flash of that weird morphing skin. That thing was still here. And from outside came the sound of crashing branches and what could only have been Jerome bellowing at the top of his lungs. He burst in, holding a busted-up piece of furniture. He swung it like a baseball bat, directly at the creature's head. It shrieked, a bone-chilling sound, and stumbled backwards out the door. Jerome was on it instantly, charging outside, still screaming bloody murder. With a last glance around the room, I took off after him. I wasn't sticking around to find out what that thing was. As we ran for the truck, I heard a final screech, then silence fell over the woods. The truck bounced and rattled like we were on an off-roading safari. Jerome swore like a sailor with a stub toe, and my head pounded in time with every bump. I couldn't stop seeing it that thing. The warped shape, the shifting skin, those, whatever it had instead of eyes. My hand shook and I fumbled for the seatbelt, but of course, the old hunk of junk didn't even have those. What the hell was that thing, man? I finally managed, my voice raspy. Jerome didn't answer. He just stared straight ahead, hands clenched on the wheel. I looked back. The road was just a dirt track fading into the twilight. No sign of anything but trees and the occasional deer bounding into the darkness. Well? What back there? Some rabid animal? Or a meth head? Jerome finally spoke, his voice low and rough. Never seen anything like that before. It, it wasn't right. We reached the paved road an eternity later and only then did Jerome relax a little. But that unease didn't go away. It clung to us. The rest of the drive was spent in silence. I tried joking, but my heart wasn't in it. My mind kept returning to the cabin, to those dark pits on the thing's face, like it was looking right through me. That image burned into my brain. It was late when we got back. Jerome looked like he was about to pass out, and I wasn't far behind. He mumbled something about selling the place dirt cheap, finding a buyer who loved fixer-uppers. I didn't care. I just wanted a hot shower and a bed. A normal bed, with actual walls and locks, not whatever nightmares the cabin left me with. 
That night I tossed and turned. Every time I drifted off, I saw the creature again. Its impossible silhouette. I woke up in a cold sweat, heart pounding like a drum solo. And I knew that thing wasn't done with us. A few days later, I couldn't shake the feeling. It was like a buzzing in the back of my head, a sixth sense screaming that we were being watched. Jerome wouldn't even talk about going back to the cabin, but that didn't make any difference. I could feel it out there, somewhere in those woods, lurking. I have to go back, I finally told Jerome. The words hung in the air between us. His eyes widened. You're crazy. That thing, we got lucky, man. We got out. But he knew it, too. We both did. Whatever that creature was, there was unfinished business between us. I could feel it in my bones. So, as much as it terrified me, I also knew this wasn't over. We packed the following weekend. Jerome wouldn't come inside, just handed me supplies from the truck, flashlights, a first aid kit, and bless him, a couple of hunting rifles. I know it sounds nuts, but I wasn't going out there without a way to protect myself. It took a few hours, that same agonizing drive through the twisting mountain roads. When I pulled up to the cabin, Jerome let out a strangled noise. He waited in the truck, engine running, looking more scared than I'd ever seen him. I stepped inside, my footsteps echoing in the dusty silence. The room where I saw the creature had that same, musty smell, like it was waiting. Come out, you freak, I called, forcing my voice to be steady. Come finish what you started. I heard a rustle from above, a sharp clicking that made the hairs on my neck stand up. Slowly, I tilted my head back. In a hole in the ceiling, I caught a glimpse of two dark, hollow eyes. An unnatural snarl echoed down, and then I saw it, descending like a monstrous spider. The creature was even worse than I remembered. Its skin rippled and changed scales, feathers, then back to that smooth, mottled flesh. It moved on spindly limbs, jerking like a broken puppet. My fear spiked, but then, a surge of anger. My cabin fever turned into raw fury. This wasn't its place. This wasn't okay. I raised the rifle and aimed. My hands shook, but I squeezed the trigger. The sound was deafening in the small room. The creature jerked backwards, screeching. It wasn't dead, but it was wounded. I fired again, and heard it clatter away, back into its hole. Silence fell. The dust settled, and the setting sun threw long, orange beams across the floor. It was done. For now, anyway. I walked back to the truck, feeling strangely hollowed out. Jerome looked at me with wide eyes, then just nodded and put the truck in gear. We drove away, either of us saying a word. We sold the cabin, of course. Took a loss, but who cares? I never went back to those woods. That thing, whatever it was, well, some things just shouldn't be known. The locals have old legends of some forest spirit, a trickster, they call it. Shapeshifter, malevolent, said to mess with folks lost in the woods. I don't know if that's what it was, or if the trickster even exists. But that cabin, that place, it's forever tainted. I moved up to Alaska a couple of years ago on a whim and haven't looked back. That's the thing about this place. It grabs a hold of you, makes you want to ditch your old life. You see why living here. It's rugged as hell, yeah, but the scenery? Makes your jaw drop every time. My name's Silas, by the way, and I live on the outskirts of a little town called Willow. 
I'm not some outdoorsy survivalist type. More of an indoorsy computer geek type, honestly. But Alaska, well, it makes you appreciate the wilderness whether you like it or not. I've got myself a place nestled right against the woods, and yeah, it gets creepy at night, but the views alone are worth it. I'll sit out on my porch watching the sunset behind the trees, and for a moment, the whole world feels all right. So last night, I was chilling on my porch, beer in hand, watching the sky change color. Suddenly, this strange rustling starts up at the edge of the woods. Now I get deer and stuff sometimes, so I didn't think much of it. Figured a small moose maybe, even though it didn't sound quite right. But when I say rustling, I don't mean that dainty walk and raise kind of noise. This was, well, it sounded like someone thrashing through the bushes with abandon. My dog, Harley, he starts going crazy. Now, he's an older golden retriever, the sweetest thing you've ever met. Doesn't bark at much, which is great cause the neighbors are a fair ways off. But last night, those hackles were up, and he was letting out these low, rumbling growls that set my teeth on edge. Being the cautious type, I head inside and grab my shotgun off the rack by the door. I figured better to have it and not need it, you know? But whatever was out there sounded big, and I sure wasn't taking any chances on my own turf. So, Harley keeps growling, I'm holding on tight to the shotgun, and there's this horrible silence for maybe a minute. Then, just as I'm beginning to think maybe it was nothing, I hear it. Not a growl or a snarl. I ain't never heard anything like it in my life, to be honest. High-pitched and kinda screechy. Sounds weird, but the closest thing I can compare it to is an eagle cry played backwards and stretched out long. Hell, it even gave me chills. And that's when I see something dart between the trees. Couldn't make out a proper shape in the fading light, but it was fast, almost a blur. But get this, it wasn't on all fours. It was up on two legs, running kinda hunched over but upright. My heart started pounding, I swear. I'd hunted before, but I ain't seen any creature move like that in my life. I yelled out something, just to try and scare it off. Don't ask me what, probably some stupid gibberish, but that screeching sound came again, even closer this time. That's when I noticed the smell. Holy hell, it was foul. Like rotten eggs and something else I couldn't place. I was gagging on it. Then I heard the thumping. That thing, whatever it was, started crashing through the trees, coming right toward my house. See, the woods come up pretty close to my porch, maybe thirty feet away at most. And I knew, deep down, this thing was gonna come right up onto those steps. Harley was freaking out bad now, barking and lunging against the door I was half leaning against. My hands were slick on the shotgun, and I was shaking like a leaf. I shouted again, Get the F asterisk CK off my property! Might as well have whispered for all the good it did. And yeah, you're probably thinking, Silas, why didn't you just blast it? Well, here's the thing, and I swear on anything, I could only see its shape against the trees, but I could also tell this thing was big like real big. And I knew enough hunting to know that even a shotgun blast, unless it was right in the sweet spot, wouldn't bring down something like this, not at first. Only thing I'd do is piss it off. I saw its outline break the edge of the woods, and it just stopped. Harley immediately went silent, whimpered a bit, and huddled close to my legs. I swear I could feel its eyes on me, hot and piercing, even through the darkness. Maybe fifteen feet between us. That smell, it hit me like a wall. I almost vomited, and damn near dropped the shotgun. The thing let out another screech, and it was so loud right by my house, 
I thought my eardrums would burst. And then, as sudden as it came, it bolted back into the woods. Just gone as if I'd imagined the whole ordeal, the horrible smell and the sound fading away almost instantly. I still hear that cry in my head sometimes, though. I've not been out on my porch since, but you best believe that gun stays close at hand. A couple of the older folks in town, they heard me talking about it at the general store. Said there are strange things in these woods, always have been. Seemed to think it sounded like something they'd heard tales of years back, back when this place was even wilder. Trouble is, they ain't saying exactly what, just muttering about old stories and leaving it at that. I tell ya, Alaska's a hell of a place, all right. You'd get used to the bears and the wolves, the blizzards and the isolation. But this, this was something different, something I still haven't wrapped my head around. Now I keep hardly close and those porch lights burning long past when I normally would. I even got myself some of those fancy security cameras. But so far, they've picked up nothing but a few curious squirrels and the neighbor's cat. But I ain't stupid. I know I didn't imagine what happened out there the other night. Sometimes, when that wind whistles through the trees and I'm on my own out here, I could swear I hear a faint echo of that screeching cry, and that rancid smell, it wafts into my nightmares. I'm not leaving, though, can't bring myself to. And besides, what if it followed me? Weeks went by with no sign of, well, whatever the hell it was. I started questioning myself, wondering if maybe too many beers and the darkness had played tricks on my mind. Even went down to the local watering hole, just to subtly see if any other folks were talking about strange sightings in the woods. Nobody seemed to have heard anything out of the ordinary which either meant I was crazy or this thing, it was smart or something, keeping to itself for a reason. Still, that didn't make the memory of that night fade any. That smell, that screeching, that thing's size, so vivid in my mind I could almost picture its outline lurking in every shadow. I'll admit, I did start to get a bit reckless after a while. Figured that whatever it was, it wasn't coming back or else it would have done so already. Hell, maybe it had wandered off, migrated to some other territory. So, a couple of Fridays ago, I was feeling brave with a few beers in me, decided to take a walk along the tree lean. You know the whole face your fears thing. I was armed, mind you not just the shotgun, but a pistol strapped to my hip, too, made me feel like some kind of cowboy in those old westerns. And wouldn't you know it, just when I start feeling like an idiot wandering the woods late at night half-drunk, I hear it. That same screech and cry, a bit further in this time, but clear as a bell. Well, all my false courage evaporated like water on a hot stove. I just stood there petrified, shotgun gripped so tight my knuckles were white. I wasn't about to venture any further into the woods. That was just asking for trouble. Instead, I started to slowly backtrack towards my porch, keeping an eye on the darkness the whole time. That's when I saw it. Something big moved between the trees, further in than I had gone that night. Just another glimpse, but this time with a sliver of moonlight catching on it. It was wet-looking, slick and slithery almost, and its back was covered with these strange knobbly bumps. But when it turned its head I saw the eyes. Like nothing on any animal I've ever seen, glowing with a faint greenish light. It took one good look at me, then gave out a blood-curdling screech even worse than the ones before, like nails on a chalkboard mixed with pure rage. Then the thing just disappeared into those woods so fast the trees barely even shook. That was it for me. I hightailed it out of there, feeling like that creature was right on my heels. Didn't stop running till I reached my porch, slammed the door shut, and dead-bolted it like a maniac. Next day, 
I called up my buddies in Anchorage. A little fibbing about a great job offer up there, and by the end of the week, I was packed and ready to get out of Willow for good. I managed to find a fellow willing to take my cabin for a decent price, especially considering the hasty sale. Harley and me, we had our bags in my beat-up old truck before the sun had even risen on moving day. As we pulled out of my driveway, I couldn't help but take one long look back at those woods. I never told anyone what I saw, just some vague excuse about missing city life and needing a change. Nobody questioned it. And maybe that was all for the best. People here believe in all sorts of things, old legends and stories of creatures that still roam these wild lands. Maybe it's true, maybe those old-timers knew things we've forgotten. Me? I ain't looking to find out. There's this name that's been haunting me ever since I saw those eyes in the woods. An old native Alaskan tale of a creature called the Kalapalik. Something that lives in the water and the dark, preys mostly on children, said to have monstrously long nails and green skin with strange bumps all over it. Sure sounds like the creature I laid eyes on, doesn't it? As for Willow, well, let someone else have it. That place has a darkness I don't want any part of anymore. City life's just fine by me from now on. Sometimes, late at night when there's even the slightest rustling outside, I swear I can hear the faint echo of that screech and smell that rotten stink. I figure that'll fade in time. At least, that's what I keep telling myself. I just had to get out of the city for a while, man. You know? Sometimes the hustle just wears you down. My buddy Eric has this little cabin up in Wyoming, near Yellowstone. No internet, spotty phone signal, and the nearest neighbor is a good three miles away across the valley. Perfect place to decompress, so he said. So I drove up there a couple weeks ago, ready to do the whole Walden Pond thing alone in nature, finding my inner whatever. Turns out, the whole, alone, part didn't exactly pan out. Eric must have forgotten to mention his other buddy, Reese. Now Reese is, well, let's just say he's not my type. Lives off the grid, grows his own food, makes his own freaking clothes out of deer hide or something. Kind of intense, always staring at you with those pale green eyes. Okay, maybe staring's the wrong word. It's more like there was something missing, behind those eyes, you get me? Like the lights were on, but nobody was home. Not that I spent much time dwelling on it. Eric was super apologetic, swore he usually gets the place to himself, but hey, more hands make light work, right? We passed the first few days doing chores, chopping wood, patching the roof, normal cabin stuff. It was pretty chill, and hey, Reese was a hell of a worker, I'll give him that. But come nightfall, that's when things started to get a bit strange. Reese had this routine of heading out into the woods, flashlight bobbing in the darkness until he was just another faint glow among the pines. Nature calls, he'd mutter, and Eric just sort of shrugged. Now, let me just say, I'm not the jumpy type. But there was something about those dark woods, and Reese disappearing into them. It gave me the creeps. One night, curiosity got the better of me. I told Eric I was stepping out to have a smoke, but instead, I followed Reese's flashlight beam. It took a good half an hour to catch up, and I had to scramble to stay hidden as he moved deeper into the trees. I still don't know what I was expecting, maybe some secret hunter's meeting, or like, a pagan ritual sacrifice. But what I found was, I don't even know how to explain it. There was a clearing, just up ahead. And in that clearing, Reese was kneeling, bare-chested in the cold mountain air. 
His back was to me, but even from a distance, I could see it wasn't right. His skin bulged and rippled, the moonlight glinting off what looked like scales. Before I could get a closer look, it happened. An enormous shape lunged out of the forest, dark and fast. For a second, it silhouetted Reese against the moon, and I almost threw up. It wasn't human, not even close. Too long, too lean, and the head. Jesus, the head was like something from a warped nightmare. Huge, elongated, with a gaping maw filled with rows of needle-like teeth. The creature slammed into Reese, and the sound. I can unhear it, man. A mix of a scream and a wet, ripping noise. I turned and ran, blind panic pushing me back through the trees. Branches lashed my face, thorns tore my skin, but I didn't slow down until I tripped and tumbled back into the cabin. Eric was there, startled by my sudden entrance. What the hell, dude? You okay? I was shaking, trying to catch my breath. Stammering about something in the woods about Reese, but he just looked confused. Said Reese would be back in the morning, same as always. I didn't sleep that night. I just sat by the window, shotgun in hand, staring out into the darkness. When the first light of dawn pierced through the trees, I made Eric come with me. My heart was pounding so hard I thought it would burst right out of my chest. We reached the clearing. It was empty. No sign of Reese, no blood, no, no nothing. It was like whatever happened the night before had been a bad dream. But I knew what I saw. I swear to God I did. Eric kept giving me this worried look, asking if I was feeling okay. Saying things about lack of sleep and mountain air getting to my head. Like I was making the whole damn thing up. I didn't care. I packed my things, threw them in the car, and took off down the dirt track. I didn't look back. Whatever was out there with Reese in the woods, it wasn't anything I wanted to meet again. My buddy Kellen told me about this sweet abandoned cabin up near Mount Hood, Oregon last year. See, we're both obsessed with urban exploring. We love creeping around forgotten places and imagining what they were like before time got to them. And who doesn't love a free place to crash during a hiking trip? So, naturally, I was beyond stoked for this adventure. Getting there was the first weird part. Kellen gave me a hand-drawn map with all these cryptic directions, like Turn left at the oak tree with the moss that looks like a face, and so on. I drove forever down logging roads, and the forest got thicker and darker the deeper I went. Finally, I found it, an old, squat cabin almost swallowed by the trees. It was way bigger than Kellen made it seem, almost like an old hunting lodge. The inside was surprisingly well-preserved, but it had a definite creepy vibe. Everything was covered in this thin layer of dust— and you could tell things hadn't been touched in years. Kellen had left a backpack full of supplies for us in the kitchen, including a couple of cheap flashlights. We cracked open some beers and explored the place. There were all sorts of strange things left behind, old medicine bottles, worn-out animal pelts hanging on the walls, taxidermy everywhere, some normal stuff like deer and birds, but then this giant owl with crazy long legs, like it was on stilts. The bedrooms were straight out of a nightmare. The beds all had these weird, lumpy mattresses covered in yellowed sheets. I remember joking to Kellen that the last people who stayed there probably went straight up insane. Daylight was fading fast, so we decided to hit the hay early, ready for a big day of hiking. We crashed on those horrifying beds, but just as I was drifting off, I heard this scratching from outside the window. 
I sat bolt upright, thinking it was some raccoon, but it sounded way too big and, well, I don't know how to say it, purposeful, for a raccoon. Kellen was still snoring like a lumberjack, so I grabbed my flashlight and went to the window, heart pounding. I flicked the light on, half expecting to see some monstrous beast staring back at me, but there was nothing, just the endless black of the forest. Probably my imagination playing tricks. I muttered to myself and decided to go back to sleep. I lay there for what felt like hours, but I couldn't shake this feeling I was being watched. Finally, I got up, grabbed my beer bottle, hey, desperate times, and walked out to the front porch. It was a clear night, and the moon was so bright it painted the trees in this eerie, silvery light. The quiet felt weird too, thick and heavy, like something was holding its breath. And then I heard it again, the scratching. This time it was coming from behind the cabin. I crept towards the noise, beer bottle held high, my heart doing a double-time jig in my chest. As I turned the corner I froze. It was there, crouched low to the ground, its back to me. My flashlight beam caught it and even from a distance, I could tell it was no animal I'd ever seen. It looked almost human, but way too tall, way too thin, hunched over like some kind of twisted spider. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, and as it turned its head towards me, I nearly choked. Its eyes, they were huge and deep black, like two bottomless pits. The worst part? Its mouth. God, I'll never forget that mouth. It stretched far too wide and was full of rows and rows of needle-like teeth. It just stared at me, and for a second, it felt like it could see into my soul. Then it let out this bone-chilling shriek that split the night, a mix between a howl and a woman screaming. I dropped the bottle and ran blindly toward the cabin, barely even seeing where I was going. I slammed the door shut and fumbled for the lock, my hands shaking so badly I could barely turn the key. Kellen was finally awake, looking groggy and confused. What the hell is going on? He grumbled, and I finally found my voice. There's something out there. I choked out, pointing out the window. Did you hear that scream? He looked at me like I'd lost my mind. I heard you yell like a little girl. You okay, man? I wanted to punch him, but the scratching started again, this time right outside the door. We both jumped. Okay, something's there, he conceded. But a bear or something, right? No way. A bear doesn't scream like that. I knew it in my bones. This was beyond any normal animal. The sheer terror I felt was like nothing else. A crash made us both spin around. Something slammed into the kitchen window, shattering the glass. We both screamed and scrambled backward. There was a shape in the darkness, a long, thin arm ending in a gnarled hand that reached inside, scrabbling blindly around the room. Kellen grabbed a splintered piece of wood that used to be a chair leg and started swinging it wildly. Get the hell away, he yelled, his voice a mix of fear and defiance. I saw that old taxidermy owl above the fireplace. Without thinking, I yanked it off the wall, holding it at arm's length like a shield. The thing, the creature, its hand froze in midair. For a heart-stopping moment, it just stared at the owl, those big, black eyes fixed on the dead bird. And then it hissed. Not like a snake, but a bone-deep sound filled with pure malice. Slowly its hand retreated, disappearing back out the window. We heard it move, rustling around the side of the cabin. I took a shaky breath. What, what in God's name was that thing? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. Kellen shook his head, his eyes wide. I don't know, dude. I don't know. 
We stayed frozen in place, listening to every sound, waiting for it to attack again. When the sun finally peeked over the horizon, we bolted out the door, not even bothering to pack. We ran for what felt like miles, stumbling through the woods until we finally stumbled onto a dirt road and managed to flag down a passing truck. The driver was an old logger who looked at us like we'd sprouted horns. When I tried to explain what happened, he just shook his head and gave us this knowing look, like he'd heard similar stories before. Up around these parts, he said in a slow drawl, some folks call them skin runners. They ain't natural, that's for sure. Say they snatch people up in the night, never to be seen again. Skin runners. I repeated the name in my head, the chill in my spine having nothing to do with the crisp mountain air. When we got back to civilization, no one believed our story, of course. Kellen and I both saw counselors for a while trying to process what felt like a shared nightmare. But even with therapy, I never shook that feeling of being watched in the dark. The memory of those black, hungry eyes and that horrifying shriek still sends shivers down my spine. Sometimes, when I think no one's listening, I whisper the name, testing it out on my tongue, Skin Runner. It sounds almost folklore-like, an old wives' tale, but I know the truth. I know there are things out there in the shadows, lurking just beyond what we can comprehend. And the next time someone tells you about a monster in the woods, don't dismiss it so quickly. Because you never know what might be waiting for you in the dark. I live on the outskirts of Pine Mills, Georgia. Population barely over 600, and half of that seems to be the folks at the retirement home. It's a quiet town, the type where the local feed mill closing down is considered major news. Been here my whole life, just like my mama and her parents before her. My friends, Elston and Briar, always joke that my family planted the first pine tree this town's named after. I usually just laughed and went on with whatever we were doing at the time. The three of us always hung out. Our folks knew each other for ages, and we were born within a couple of weeks of each other. Our moms sometimes joked about which of us would marry who first. It wasn't like that, though. We were just good buddies. The type that could hang out all day, fishing on Briar's granddad's pond or just hanging by the old train tracks without needing to say much. It was October of last year, a few weeks shy of my 26th birthday. Nothing much to celebrate. No big job, no girlfriend, still living with my mama to help take care of her. But hey, at least I had my buddies. I remember Briar's grandpa had passed away recently, and we were planning to take a trip out to the old man's property outside of town. Briar told us his folks were gonna be cleaning up, sorting through belongings and such, and he needed some help going through his granddad's workshop. That Saturday rolled around, gray and drizzly. I piled into my beat-up truck and swung by Briar's place to pick him up. Elston, ever punctual, was already there, a travel mug steaming in his hand. We gave Briar some good-natured ribbing for being late to his own cleanup. Elston hopped in the back. Briar was quiet on the drive, which was kinda unusual. But we figured the whole grandpa thing had him down. We didn't say much, just kept the radio low and gave him some space. About half an hour out of town, Elston piped up from the back. Geez, how much further is this place, Briar? Feels like a whole different county out here. Briar chuckled. Yeah, man, it's way the heck out there. Grandad wanted his peace and quiet. About ten more minutes on a bumpy dirt road, and we pulled up to what had to be the property. There was a small farmhouse, 
weathered and white, with an overgrown yard around it. Behind it, a big rusty old barn leaned at a worrying angle. Briar stepped out and stretched, and we followed suit. You boys ready to do some heavy lifting? he asked, giving us a crooked grin. Elston just groaned and said, Dude, you owe us so many beers. We walked a loop around the barn, trying to figure out how to get inside without the whole thing toppling over. Briar pointed to a half-rotted door hanging on a single hinge. Grandad wasn't the handiest man, he said with a sigh. We figured that would be our entrance. Inside, it was like something out of an old movie. Tools of all kinds hung on the walls, covered in dust and cobwebs. Shafts of weak sunlight pierced holes in the roof, and the musty smell made me cough. Okay, Briar. Where to start? I asked, rubbing my eyes. I felt a chill and wasn't sure if it was the damp air or just some weird feeling. Briar shrugged and wandered toward a workbench in the far corner. It was covered with half-finished projects, scraps of wood, and tools. I moved closer and started sorting through bits of metal and old screws. Elston was behind me, grumbling and muttering to himself. Suddenly, he shouted way too loud. Hey, what the hell is this? He held up what looked like a strip of dark, leathery hide. Briar came over, frowning. Don't know, put it back. His voice was a little sharper than usual. Elston shrugged and tossed it back on the bench. He kept sifting through some wood scraps. His usual light-heartedness dimmed a bit. After a bit, he said quietly, Place gives me the creeps, man. I kind of felt something similar, but chalked it up to the gloomy atmosphere. We kept sorting for a while, loading up boxes and sorting out tools. Elston kept glancing around the shadows, and I was starting to get a bit antsy myself. Hey, Briar. I started, but he cut me off. Hold up. I think I found something, he said, leaning closer to the bench. Check this out. In the corner, half hidden under some old newspapers, was a wooden box. Plain and weathered, with a tarnished metal latch. Briar reached out a hesitant hand, hesitated, then flipped it open. I moved in to get a better look. Inside wasn't anything special. Just a bundle of dirty, brittle papers wrapped in old twine. Briar lifted it out carefully and we gathered around to see what it was. Dust flew up as he untied the twine, revealing a stack of papers filled with faded, spidery writing. Letters? Elston asked. But Briar was already frowning and scanning the top page. This doesn't look like Grandad's writing, he mumbled. Maybe some old mail? Or something your great-grandma wrote? I suggested. Briar didn't respond, just kept reading. His face went a shade paler, eyebrows drawn tight together. His hand started to tremble slightly as he flipped through the pages. Elston and I exchanged a nervous glance. It had to be more than just some old letters to cause this reaction. Finally, Briar looked up. His eyes were wide, a flicker of something like fear in them. We gotta get out of here, he breathed, voice barely above a whisper. He fumbled with the papers, shoving them back in the box, and haphazardly retied the twine. Whoa, Briar, hold on. What's the deal? I asked, trying to keep my voice calm. He shook his head, eyes darting around like a cornered animal. We've gotta go. Now. He turned and bolted towards the door, still clutching at the bundle of papers. Elston and I scrambled after him, confusion gnawing at my gut. I could hear Briar muttering something under his breath, but couldn't make out the words. We burst out of the barn, into the dreary gray daylight. Briar ran straight to his old pickup, fumbling with the keys. I glanced back at the barn 
a prickle of unease twisting my insides. Had something moved in the shadowy doorway? I shook my head, attributing it to my rising nerves. Come on, guys! Get in! Briar yelled, his voice tense. Elston and I hopped into the truck, and Briar gunned the engine. He peeled out of the property, tires kicking up dirt and gravel. None of us spoke, the silence heavy and oppressive. Briar looked straight ahead, his knuckles white where he gripped the steering wheel. After a while, Elston finally spoke. Briar, what's going on? Why'd we have to leave like that? Briar took a deep breath, still not taking his eyes off the road. Those papers. He hesitated, as if choosing his words carefully. They're not what I thought. Not Grandad's letters. They're something else. Silence settled again, broken only by the rumble of the truck. I shot Elston a worried look. I could tell he was as concerned as I was. Finally, Briar cleared his throat. Have you ever heard stories? About things that live in the deep woods? Not human, not like us. Elston scoffed. Come on, Briar. You talking old wives' tales? Ghosts and monsters? A flicker of anger crossed Briar's face. I'm serious. This town, there's history here. Stuff people don't talk about much. He hesitated. Look, those papers, they were journals. My granddad's, going back way before he was even born. It was like records of sightings, of something out there. A chill ran down my spine. Elston looked skeptical, but he wasn't saying anything now. Briar took a deep breath and pressed on. The descriptions, from decades ago, they sounded a whole lot like Dash. Before he could finish, Elston yelled, Look out! I slammed back against the seat as Briar swerved. In the middle of the road, just ahead of us, stood a figure. Not a human figure. Tall and gaunt, it hunched awkwardly on spindly legs that seemed too long for its body. The head was small and elongated with skin stretched tight like old leather over the skull. The thing didn't even turn to face us. It just stood there, blocking the road, completely still. For a moment, time seemed to freeze. Then Briar recovered, flooring the accelerator and aiming the truck straight for that creature. My heart pounded a frantic rhythm against my ribs as the gas pedal hit the floor. The tires squealed in protest, and the old truck lurched forward. We were committed now, barreling straight towards that impossible creature. The thing still didn't move, maybe it didn't see us, or maybe it knew it had nowhere to run. Just as I thought we were going to hit it, the creature finally reacted. With a speed that sent chills down my spine, it leapt off the road and into the trees. The truck swerved and for a moment I truly thought we were going to roll over. We skidded to a halt, dirt flying into the air. We sat in stunned silence for what felt like an eternity. Finally, Briar turned his head slowly towards us. His eyes were wild, his face pale enough to be made of bone. You saw that? Right? You both. His voice was barely a whisper. Elston and I nodded weakly, too shaken to speak. We were all thinking the same thing what in the hell was that? Without a word, Briar turned the key and shifted back into gear. We took off down the road, the tension in the cab thick enough to choke us. We didn't speak, didn't dare to process what we had just seen. Finally, Briar pulled over to the side again and cut the engine. The silence descended again, broken only by our ragged breathing. After a few minutes, Briar turned to us, his voice steadier now. Okay, that was the thing from those papers. I know it. The way it moved, what it looked like. He trailed off, 
unable to finish the thought. We sat for what felt like hours, just staring out the windshield. We had to come up with a plan, but my mind was blank. What could we even do? Call the cops? Who the hell would believe us? I thought back to those papers, the faded writing describing creatures lurking in the shadows of these woods. This wasn't some urban legend. This was real. And it was dangerous. Elston spoke up first. Briar, where did you put those papers? Briar shook his head. I didn't take them. We can't have that here, not after. He didn't finish the sentence. Frustration flared up in me. Briar! Why the hell not? That's evidence. Briar's face hardened. No. That's the thing's history. They knew about it. The people who wrote that. They're all dead, Elston. Or missing, or worse. That journal it's cursed. And I won't bring that into my home. We argued for a while about the papers, but eventually, exhaustion took over. We decided our only option was to get back to town. It was a tense, silent drive. Briar never took his eyes off the road, and Elston and I kept glancing back, expecting the creature to appear at any moment. Finally, the familiar streets of Pine Mills came into view. For the first time in hours, I felt a sliver of relief. We were back in civilization. Maybe there would be safety among other people. Briar dropped Elston off at his place, promising we'd talk soon and figure things out. He then swung by my house, looking drawn and tired. He didn't go inside, just lingered in the truck with the engine idling. I should have listened to Grandad. He warned me about those woods. He never went out to that place after Grandma died. I didn't know what to say. There were too many questions, too much horror swirling in my head. Finally, exhaustion won out. I'm gonna get some sleep. We can talk more in the morning. I stepped out and headed towards the front door, my legs feeling like lead. That night, sleep was an elusive beast. I tossed and turned, the image of that creature burned into my mind. I knew, deep down, that my life had changed irrevocably. There were things hiding in the shadows, and we had seen them. The next morning, I waited for Briar's call, but it never came. After a few hours, worry gnawing at me, I decided to head over to his house. I figured he probably needed help cleaning out the rest of his granddad's things anyway. When I pulled up, something felt wrong. It took me a moment to realize what it was. Briar's truck was gone. My heart pounded in my chest as dread slowly seeped in. I tried calling him, but it went straight to voicemail. A horrible, sinking feeling settled in my stomach. I knocked on the door but there was no answer. Against my better judgment, I tried the doorknob, and to my surprise it opened. As I cautiously stepped into the house, I called out for Briar. Silence echoed back at me. Panic began to rise in my throat as I moved from room to room, a growing sense of unease prickling at my skin. In the kitchen, I found the culprit. The back door stood slightly ajar, swinging gently. My stomach lurched. Briar wouldn't have just left without telling me. Especially not after yesterday. I inched my way toward the backyard, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm. And there, on the ground, lay Briar's phone. Cracked and discarded. A shiver ran down my spine. In the distance I heard it. A rustling, a cracking of branches. My head whipped around, and through the trees I saw a movement. I knew that loping, inhuman gait. It was back. I didn't think, just ran. I sprinted across the yard, towards the tree line. Maybe if I could reach the road, I'd be safe. 
I heard it gaining on me, that awful clicking sound it made growing louder, closer. And then, I saw the road just ahead. With a final burst of speed, I stumbled out of the woods. I looked back, hoping I had lost it. Too late. It was standing just on the other side of the trees, staring at me with those unnatural eyes. For a moment we stayed frozen, my ragged breaths loud in the silence. And then, the creature turned and disappeared back into the woods. I never saw Briar again. I like to think that the papers were wrong, that somehow he managed to escape whatever that creature was, something in the woods people call the rake back. But deep down, I know the truth. The woods out near Pine Mills hold more than just trees and shadows. They hold secrets and ancient things that are better left undisturbed. I lived out in the countryside of Oklahoma for a little while. Needed a reset, you know? Had this cute little farmhouse surrounded by endless cornfields. Kind of place where you know your neighbors but mostly keep to yourself. I figured it would be good to clear my head after a messy breakup with, surprise, surprise, another commitment-phobic man-child. I'm Xandrin, by the way. People call me Xan. First few months went great, honestly. I found my groove, running trails in the morning, then working from home doing my freelance graphic design stuff. Did some painting on the side. Afternoons were usually spent messing around in the yard, listening to trashy podcasts while I attempted gardening with, let's say, limited success. The peace and quiet was everything I needed, at first. But you know how it goes, right? After a while, you start hearing every little creak of the house, every little rustle in the corn. I started catching myself staring way too long into those fields, half expecting something to blink back. My overactive imagination started working overtime, which I figured wasn't ideal given the amount of true crime content I consume. One evening, it was already getting dark, and I was about to head inside after a particularly pathetic attempt at weeding when I saw it. Well, kind of. Caught it out of the corner of my eye, something hunched down at the far end of the cornfield. I thought I might have just been seeing things, but then the figure, thing, moved. It was tall, freakishly tall, like a scarecrow somehow come to life but with way too many limbs, all long and spindly. The way it moved was wrong, twitchy and skittering. I froze. I'd always thought of myself as logical, the kind of person who doesn't buy into weird stories or jump at shadows. But my gut, plain old primal fear, that was doing backflips right about now. I finally came to my senses and bolted inside, slamming the door shut behind me. From the window, I watched the field, my heart a frantic drumroll. Now, there was nothing. Figured it was just a trick of the light, but I kept the yard floodlights on for the rest of the night. The next few days were filled with anxiety. I didn't know what was worse, the idea that I'd actually seen something out there, or that I was so jumpy my mind was playing tricks on me. I started researching local legends, looking for anything that fit the description of that, whatever it was. I even found this creepy old article from the 70s about some farmer who'd found two of his cows completely drained of blood. Nothing conclusive, of course, but it definitely added a dose of nightmare fuel to the whole situation. I confided in a friend, Kiana. I expected the eye roll in some. Zan, you need to stop binge-watching horror movies. But she'd lived out in the area before, and she just got real serious. Told me to keep all the doors and windows bolted, to let her know if I saw or heard anything else. She didn't elaborate, said some things were better not messed with. I definitely noticed the uneasy look on her face. 
It made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. About a week later, I was in the barn. I'd turned it into my makeshift art studio. I was sketching with some charcoal, trying to work out a gnarled root system on paper, when I heard it, a soft, scuttling, scratching noise. It was definitely coming from inside the barn. I grabbed a rusty old rake, my heart pounding a mile a minute. Cautiously, I made my way towards the noise. I peered into the back corner, the shadows thick and foreboding. And that's when I saw them, two eyes shining back at me, like amber caught in the flashlight beam. They seemed to hover just above the ground, and I realized whatever this thing was, it was big. It hissed low and guttural. The rake clattered from my shaking hands onto the floor. It moved. I can't even describe it properly the way it seemed to flow on those spider-like legs. The sight of it was wrong, just wrong. Like a twisted sketch brought to life, its outline blurry against the darkness. Its body was thin, skeletal, covered in coarse hair that seemed to bristle. And the head, the head was all wrong, stretched and tapered with too many teeth crammed inside. I stumbled backwards, eyes locked on those glowing eyes, my legs suddenly useless. It came closer, and I could smell it, a damp, musty rot, like old earth and decay. I realized it wasn't coming for me, not directly. It was circling around the edge of the barn, towards the chicken coop. I snapped out of my paralysis, my screen piercing the silence. My chickens! I charged at it, rake held high. But it moved like greased lightning, disappearing into the coop. Frantic, I fumbled with the latch. As soon as the door was ajar, I heard the panic squawking turn into choked gurgles. Blood spattered the inside of the coop, feathers and, oh God, the carnage made me gag. My beloved chickens, Betty, Wilma, Veronica, all of them, in that moment, something shifted inside me. The fear didn't go away, but now it was edged with rage. This wasn't some stray animal, not some trick of my imagination. This thing was a threat to me, to anyone who crossed its path. I grabbed a flashlight and the biggest axe I could find, venturing into the night. I spotted it across the field, a dark silhouette against the pale moonlight, dragging something towards the edge of the corn. My plan was not fully formed. Honestly, it was more instinct than anything, some primal urge to defend what was mine. It took everything in me not to freeze as I got closer, the stench growing stronger with every step. Finally, I saw what it was dragging. It was Elwood, my neighbor's old dog his body limp and broken. I don't know what snapped at that moment, whether it was grief or just blind rage, but I went for it. Screamed like a banshee and charged, swinging the axe with everything I had. It whirled, those eyes catching the light, and I saw a flash of those teeth, a gaping maw in that long, skeletal face. I didn't even think, just swung. The axe connected with a sickening thunk. At first, I thought I'd missed, because the damn thing didn't even flinch. It turned towards me, those eyes like glowing coals, and I realized my axe was now embedded in its shoulder. Now, the creature shrieked, well, more like a high-pitched whistle mixed with a rusty door hinge. It lashed out with those absurdly long claws. I barely managed to duck, but not before it tore my jacket to shreds. I stumbled, the adrenaline both empowering me and throwing my aim completely off. I swung again wildly, the axe just glancing off at this time as it whirled back towards me. It swiped at my leg, and I felt a searing pain. I looked down to see deep gouges across my thigh, blood already seeping out. Panic flared. It was faster than me, stronger. I was barely keeping it at bay, but I was bleeding out. It crouched, 
swaying back and forth. Was it playing with me? Testing my weakness? I knew I wasn't going to win a prolonged fight. I remembered the chickens. That flicker of primal fury. I needed a distraction, something that would stop it in its tracks. Without thinking, I bolted back into the barn and found a can of kerosene and some old rags. I soaked the rags and, grabbing a lighter from my pocket, lit the makeshift torch. My heart was a jackhammer in my chest. I could feel its eyes burning on me as I stepped back out. Let's dance, you freak, I yelled, my voice rough. Honestly, I was mostly bluffing. But I knew fire was my best bet. I fainted, making like I was going to charge. Instead, I hurled the torch towards it. Maybe something animalistic kicked in. It hesitated, watching the flames arc towards it. That was my chance. I sprinted away, not towards the house, but further into the fields. I heard that horrible whistle behind me, along with the heavy thumping. It was coming. My lungs burned, my leg pulsed with every step, but I stumbled on. The corn stalks hid me, disoriented it. I ducked behind a thicket, my breath ragged. I counted silently, one, two, three. I strained to listen past my own panting. Did it give up? Was it still circling, trying to sniff me out? Time felt warped, slow and viscous. Finally, I couldn't wait any longer. I burst out. I'd have to risk it, take my chances running for the house. But when I emerged from the cornstalks, it was right there. It moved faster than I thought possible, like a shadow come to life. It caught me before I even had time to scream. I braced for those claws, but instead, its long, bony fingers wrapped around my throat, squeezing. The world went dark around the edges. And then, nothing. I felt myself being lifted, dragged, my vision flickering in and out. The last thing I remember is the smell of burning fur and those glowing eyes staring right at me. I woke up on the edge of the cornfield, my whole body screaming in protest. There were deep scratch marks on my neck, and the leg wound pulsed with a sickening rhythm. I tasted blood. I must have drifted off again because when I looked up, a few hours had passed. It was dawn, a soft pink light stretching across the sky. I stumbled back to the farmhouse, leaving a trail of blood behind me. I collapsed inside, locking every single door, my hands shaking too hard to work properly. I bandaged up my wounds as best I could, downing painkillers that barely took the edge off. Finally, exhaustion overtook me, and I slept. I reported everything to the police, of course. They searched the property, but there was nothing. No bloody trail, no signs of struggle. The wounds were animal-like, they said, but the report just gathered dust on some desk, I'm sure. Kiana came over, helped me pack my stuff. The quiet felt unbearable now. I couldn't imagine looking out at those cornfields without seeing that shape lurking at the edge of my vision. I moved back to the city a few days later. Apartment living, high-rise, felt a lot safer than that lone little farmhouse. I don't sleep well anymore. Every little creak, every rustle sets my pulse racing. Sometimes, I swear I catch glimpses of something elongated and wrong in the corner of my eye. And I always dream of those eyes, those glowing embers that haunt my nightmares. They called it a bone strider, Kiana told me, some old bit of local lore. A creature that stalks the lonely, feeds on the isolated. I can't shake the feeling, the knowledge, that there are things out there we're not meant to understand or survive.
I always loved exploring abandoned places. There's a strange thrill digging into the forgotten past and the mystery of a place no longer used. My name is Elian, and my buddies and I have been into urban exploration for a few years now. We've hit up old factories, warehouses, a couple of spooky asylums, you name it. This time, though, we were going somewhere remote. I'm based in Colorado and out west, tucked away in the mountains, there's a ghost town called Dunstan. It was an old mining settlement, abandoned when the veins ran dry back in the early 1900s. Now, Dunstan isn't easy to get to. We're talking hours of driving, followed by a hike on trails that probably haven't seen a foot in a century. But the photos online are amazing, weathered wooden houses, a main street frozen in time, even an old saloon with dusty bottles still on the shelves. This was gonna be our epic urbex trip. So, there's me, my buddy Kai, and his girlfriend, Noemi. We're not dumb, we prepped. Headlamps, first aid kits, maps, tons of water, the whole deal. We set off before dawn, figuring we'd beat the worst of the midday heat. The drive out there was long, just scrubby desert until the mountains started hulking upwards. It's funny how quick civilization thins out. One minute you're on a paved road, the next it's dirt and gravel, then you're parking in a clearing and staring at an overgrown trailhead. Well, guess this is where we become mountain goats, Noemi joked, adjusting her pack. Even she, not the most outdoors a type, was grinning. It felt like a proper adventure. The first part of the hike was tough but manageable, just steadily uphill. The scenery was incredible, though. None of that manicured park stuff back in the city. This was raw, sun-bleached, and harsh. We were all feeling pretty good until we realized we'd lost the trail. Okay, not lost-lost, but definitely straight off track. Oh... Kai muttered, squinting at his phone. GPS signal's totally gone. We took a break, getting our bearings. Sure, we were off course, but as long as we kept heading up, we'd eventually hit Dunstan. That little glitch of getting lost set a tense tone for the rest of the hike. By the time we actually saw crumbling walls through the trees, we were more relieved than excited. Dunstan definitely delivered on the creepy atmosphere. I mean, everything was just sitting there. Crumbling wooden houses, rusted-out equipment, even a wagon with a sun-bleached canvas cover slumped beside it. And the quiet? Man dead silent except for the wind whistling through broken windows. I kinda get why folks left, I said half-joking. This place gives me the shivers. We wandered around, snapping pictures and just soaking it in. The saloon was the highlight, those dusty bottles, the cracked mirrors. It was like a scene straight out of a western movie. That's when it started. Not anything big, just a weird scratching noise. It sounded like it came from behind the bar. At first, we thought it was an animal. Maybe a rat that had gotten inside. Yo, we sharing this ghost town or what? Kai yelled, looking around half-heartedly. Noemi and I laughed, but the scratching didn't stop. It grew louder, almost frantic. Then, something bumped against the bar from the other side, hard enough to rattle the bottles. We froze. That didn't sound like any animal we knew. It was heavy. I swear, if one of you is messing with me. I started, but Noemi made a shushing motion. The scratching turned into this low, guttural growling sound that sent chills down my spine. We were slowly backing away, keeping our eyes on the bar, when a hand clawed its way over the top. I don't mean a human hand. This thing was enormous, bigger than any man's, with gnarled, blackened fingers and ragged nails the size of steak knives. I don't remember who screamed first. 
We just turned and ran. Kai grabbed my arm and yanked me, and Noemi stumbled after. We didn't look back, just barged through the saloon doors and sprinted down the dusty main street of Dunstan. Behind us, there was a splintering crash, glass shattering, and something roaring in rage. We didn't slow down, hearts pounding against our ribs. We tripped over roots and rocks, branches whipping at our faces. I thought my lungs would explode before that creature caught us. We must have run for miles before we finally risked a look back. Nothing. Dunstan had vanished, swallowed by the trees and mountains. My legs were about to give out when I saw a dirt track ahead, the kind used by park rangers. We burst onto it, waving our arms frantically at the first pickup truck that rumbled past. The driver... An old guy with a bushy beard seemed more amused than alarmed by three sweaty, wild-eyed hikers appearing out of nowhere. He listened to our panic tale, and to his credit, he didn't immediately call us crazy. There ain't no saloon in Dunstan, he said, scratching his chin. And there sure as hell ain't no critters that big in these parts. He took us back to our car and we drove away from Dunstan as fast as we could. Back on the main roads, surrounded by normal life, the whole thing felt unreal. But I still remember the feel of those monstrous claws scraping over the bar and the fury behind that roar. The thing back there, whatever it was, didn't want us in its territory. There's a reason ghost towns get abandoned. Maybe some places aren't meant to be disturbed, some secrets are best left buried. I should have listened to my gut when I saw the Help Wanted sign hanging off that old gas station out in rural Nevada. Heck, name's Braxton Wilder, and I don't scare easy. But there's something about the back roads that makes a man's hair stand up, you know? Problem is, when you're broke and your truck's on fumes, desperate, tends to beat out. Cautious. The job itself seemed harmless enough. Old man Beck, the owner, needed someone to clean out an abandoned mine shaft on his property. Said something about a potential buyer who wanted a survey and he was too old to go clambering around dusty tunnels himself. Pay was solid, cash under the table for a few days of work. Honestly, sounded too good to be true, and well, you know what they say about that. First day out there was uneventful. It's one of those old-timey mines, barely big enough to stand up in, all rough-hewn rock and splintery support beams. Place hadn't been touched in years, Dust everywhere, the odd glint of fool's gold, and a whole symphony of unnerving creaks and groans that echoed in the stillness. I got a fair way in, headlamp bouncing, and started clearing rubble. Second day, I started finding the, well, the leavings. First it was animal bones scattered like dice. Nothing unusual for a long-abandoned mine, right? Things get hungry down there. Then I found the tufts of fur, not coyote, not bobcat. Something bigger, thicker, and darker, almost a murky brown streaked with black. Then it got bad. The smell hit me first, coppery and rotten, like a butcher shop left out in the sun. I almost puked. Then I saw them, the prince. Not an animal I recognized. Too many toes, claws like fish hooks. They trailed deeper into the mine, and something told me I really didn't want to follow. But hey, old man Beck was paying good money, and a wilder never backs down from a job. Third day, that's when it all went to hell. I'd cleared a passage leading into a larger chamber, piles of rocks and dirt everywhere. Must have hit a weak spot, because next thing I know, the whole damn ceiling starts rumbling. I'd barely have time to dive for cover before the rock slide hits. 
When the dust settles, I'm buried waist deep, flashlight smashed, and the only light is a faint sliver from the now blocked tunnel entrance. It's enough to see I'm not alone down there. At first, all I catch are the eyes, glowing in the dark, an unnatural shade of amber, like fire trapped in glass. Then it steps into the light. I swear my heart stopped. The thing's massive, easily seven feet tall, even hunched over, and built like a bear that's been hitting the gym too hard. Its fur, same color as those tufts I found, is matted and filthy, and there's something wrong with its face. Like it's been stretched too tight, muzzle too long, teeth too big, almost like a wolf, but twisted and wrong. It stares at me, head cocked like it's curious, and lets out a low growl that sets my teeth on edge. My hand fumbles for the pickaxe I brought, but it's no use. I'm a sitting duck trapped under a ton of rock. It takes a step closer than another, those claws scraping against the stone floor. I figure this is it. I'm gonna end up like those bones I found scattered in the tunnel. I close my eyes, bracing for the impact, and that's when I hear it. A gunshot echoes from up the tunnel, deafening in the enclosed space. The creature flinches, lets out a yelp I can feel in my chest, and suddenly it's gone, retreating back into the darkness. A moment later, old man Beck appears at the tunnel entrance a smoking rifle in his hands. He takes one look at my situation, lets out a curse that would make a sailor blush, and starts to dig. Beck digs like a man and, his old bones moving with surprising speed. Rock and dirt fly as I give him what directions I can from my half-buried position. Every scrape of the shovel feels like an hour, and all the while, I'm waiting for that thing to come lunging out of the shadows. After what seems like an eternity, he breaks through. First my legs are free, then I can scramble out. Beck pulls me the rest of the way, then collapses in a wheeze, his face pale. You see that? I gasp, pointing to the cave-in. There's something down there! Some kind of beast! The old man nods, his eyes grim. I know. I saw it. Been lurking around these parts for years. Folks call it the Hollerback. Hollerback? The name echoes in my head, strange and unsettling. Old wife's tale. He rasps. Reckon it ain't so much a tale after all. We gotta get you to the hospital, son. That leg looks nasty. Turns out I broke my leg in the rock slide. Took a few weeks in traction, a whole lot of physical therapy afterward, but I healed up. Beck visited me once or twice. Still didn't say much, but he paid me like he promised, even threw in a little extra for hazard duty. I tried asking again about the holler back, but he'd just shake his head and mutter something about things best left forgotten. The rest of the summer, I worked odd jobs trying to save up enough to finally ditch Nevada. Try not to think too much about my near-death experience. It worked, mostly. Except for the dreams. Always end up back in that mine tunnel, dark and choking with dust. Those amber eyes gleaming at me, that low, hungry growl rattling in my ears. Wake up in a cold sweat, my pulse pounding like a drum. End of August... My legs mostly mended, and my truck finally has enough gas to make a run for it. I pack up my stuff, ready to put that whole nightmare behind me. Then I see the news report. Old man Beck found dead on his property. Mauled, they said. Animal attack. I try telling myself it's probably a mountain lion. Got lost, got desperate, but deep down, I know what it was. The next morning, I don't hit the road. Instead, I drive back out to that godforsaken gas station. The old, help-wanted, sign is still there, swaying in the breeze. This time, I walk right past it, 
and head towards the mine entrance. Got my pickaxe back from Beck's shed, and there's a fresh box of shells next to the rifle he left leaning against the wall. Some part of me knows this is stupid, suicidal maybe. But something else, something hot and stubborn in my gut, that won't let the holler back, or whatever the hell it is, get away with it. I step across the threshold into the mine, and the darkness closes in around me. Air's damp and stale, smelling of iron and old earth. My gut clenches, but I keep going, deeper into the belly of the mountain. I swear, the whole place feels different this time. Like there's a hum in the air, a wrongness that prickles at the back of my neck. Finally, I reach the chamber where the cave happened. It's eerily untouched, like the creature knows I'm coming. And there it is, hunched in the shadows at the far end of the cavern. Those eyes, blazing like embers. It snarls this time, showing a mouthful of yellowed fangs. I raise the rifle, my hands shaking more with fury than fear. Before I can even line up a shot, it lunges, a blur of muscle and matted fur. I fire, more out of instinct than aim, and hear a roar of pain that shakes the whole damn mine. The holler back, or whatever the hell it is, is still coming. I throw myself to the side, dodging its claws by a hair's breadth. The pickaxe is still in my hand, and out of desperation, I swing it as the creature whirls back around. Metal bites into its side, and it screeches, stumbling. It's enough. I scramble back, grab the rifle, and fire again. And again. Each shot sends it staggering, but the thing just won't go down. Rage and terror make my vision a blur of red and brown, the roar of gunfire and the beast's howls echoing in my ears until they merge into one monstrous chorus. Finally, it happens. One bullet finds its mark straight through the eye. The hollerback lets out one last, shuddering wail, then crashes to the ground, its massive form trembling. And then, it's still. I don't remember dropping the rifle or sinking to my knees. I just sit there, staring at the monstrous carcass, adrenaline bleeding out of me and leaving a hollowness in its wake. Maybe I should have let it go. Maybe I'm as twisted as the thing I just killed. It doesn't matter now. I don't leave the mine for hours. When I finally drag myself out, the sun's starting to set. They'll find the body eventually. Probably say it was a bear attack. And they won't be wrong, exactly. Sometimes, there's monsters hiding in plain sight, even out here in the middle of nowhere. Sometimes, to beat the monster, maybe you gotta become a little monstrous yourself. I live in a quiet little cul-de-sac in El Paso, Texas. You know the ones I'm talking about, a little loop of homes tucked away, a safe little bubble away from the hustle and bustle. Never thought anything could happen around here, but here I am, fingers trembling over this keyboard, wondering if anyone will even believe what I write. Let me back up. My wife, Anya, and I work opposite schedules, so we mostly have the place to ourselves during the day. That's fine by me. I'm a graphic designer, so I work from home. Keeps things simple, especially with our dog, Maverick. He's a golden retriever, loves those belly rubs, that one. A few days ago, Anya left for work around 8 a.m. like usual. That's the thing, folks. It started out so darn normal. Settling in at my desk, I poured a mug of coffee. Something fell off, but I just figured I was still waking up. That feeling didn't go away, though. It was like a pair of eyes stuck on me. But every time I turned to check around the house, nothing. Figured it was Maverick messing with me, trying to get a walk in early, 
but the dog was curled up under my desk snoring away. Finally, after wasting half the morning distracted, I figured I'd take the dog out before the midday heat got unbearable. Maverick was beside himself as soon as I grabbed the leash, practically hopping on his hind legs. He must have sensed my agitation. See, usually, a walk around the cul-de-sac is no biggie. Ten minutes tops. Right around the loop, back home. Easy peasy, even with Maverick pulling me along. But something was different this time. The air felt heavy like before a storm, but the sky was that blinding El Paso blue. We took off, and almost immediately, Maverick started acting odd. Ears perked up, tail stiff as a board. This dog never barks unless there are serious snacks involved, but now, low growls were rumbling from his throat. I told him to knock it off, but he wouldn't listen. He kept tugging me towards the little green belt at the end of the cul-de-sac. Anyone else, they'd hightail it back home. Not me. Curiosity killed the cat and all that, and I ain't no feline. The only thing worse than not knowing is, well, knowing. Especially once I caught a glimpse of what Maverick was focusing on. There was a figure hunched over in the scruffy brush, just out of clear sight. Too short to be a full-grown person, but too big to be some kid trying to hide from their folks. Maybe a homeless person having a tough time. That explanation lasted all of two seconds before it vanished clean out of my head. This figure, whatever it was, moved with a creepy, fluid grace not like any human I've ever seen. I froze. Adrenaline kicked in, a hot rush through my veins. Maverick was straining against the leash so hard, I thought he'd choke himself. But I couldn't just leave. My voice, when I managed to clear my throat, came out a pathetic squeak. Hello? The thing twitched. Not like it was startled, but more like testing some new muscles, you know the feeling? My common sense, long gone by then, gave one last gurgle of protest before shutting off completely. I took a hesitant step forward, Maverick dragging me along. That's when I saw its face. Well, what passed for a face? It was turned towards me, eyes glittering in the scrubby shade. Now I'm no biologist, but that was no coyote or mountain lion I was staring at. The thing was hairless, skin-like wrinkled leather stretched tight over its skull. And the eyes, folks, nothing in nature looks like that. They glowed a sickly green, pupilless, and fixed on me like I was its next meal. Maverick finally made a break for it, the leash snapping out of my numb hand. Lunging straight at the thing, bless his oversized, golden heart, he went for its throat. What followed was the stuff of nightmares. Yelps, snarls, and this awful, wet ripping sound. I don't even want to think about what. Look, Maverick was a good dog, okay? Big and goofy, and braver than I could ever hope to be. There was a flash of movement, the creature rearing up, and then I was running. Blinded by tears, tripping over my own feet, I somehow made it home. I slammed the door and leaned against it, chest heaving. Anya would be back soon. Anya would know what to do. She was always the level-headed one. I called her, but my voice sounded all choked up, and she wouldn't understand why I was babbling some nonsense about monsters. I forced myself up, locked every door and window. Maverick was... I'm not gonna let my mind go there. He bought me time, and time was all I had right now. The sun's setting now. Every rustle of leaves outside makes me jump. Anya should be home soon, but even then. I'm not sure what happens next. Maybe the cops will think I'm crazy. Hell, I think I'm crazy. But I saw what I saw, and I know Maverick didn't make it. No way he could have. 
I just have to keep praying that thing, that whatever it is, doesn't come back for me. The house felt different the moment Anya walked in. Maybe it was the way my face was pale and drawn, or the too bright chatter about some drama with her co-worker that wouldn't stop tumbling out of my mouth. She cut me off, her hand warm on my arm. I could feel the tension in her fingers, a mirror to the knot of dread in my gut. Hey, what's wrong? You're acting off, she said, concern replacing her usual briskness. The truth, bubbling up like bile in my throat, came out in a strangled whisper. I told her everything the unease, maverick, that thing. It all sounds bonkers, even typing it now. Anya listened, didn't interrupt once. But when I finished, when the awful story was laid bare between us, I could see it in her eyes. Not disbelief, but fear. She knows me, knows I ain't the type to just make things up. We fell into a tense silence. Outside, the sun dipped low, painting the street that sickly orange you only see right before a storm hits. I think we both knew, deep down, the worst was yet to come. The waiting was the worst part. Every creak of the house, every whisper of wind, made me jump. The thought of that creature lurking out there. Then Anya stood. A strange determination settled over her. Cops aren't gonna help. Who are they gonna believe, right? The guy with a missing dog and a wild story? She was right, of course. It'd be my word against the void. If I even survived long enough to talk to the police. I asked what she was planning. She grinned, just a flicker of her old self before the worry lines took over again. Remember that old shotgun grandpa left me? It's in the attic, hasn't been touched for years. Might be rusty as hell, but worth a try. I'll tell you, folks, I haven't been so scared in my life as I was when we crept into the attic. That place is a dust trap, full of cobwebs and shadows that seem to dance and shift with their own malicious life. The shotgun was there, heavier than I remembered, with a box of ammo covered in a thick layer of dust. Back downstairs, I loaded it with shaky hands. Anya handed me a flashlight. You sure about this? There was a plea in her eyes, but she wouldn't voice it. We both knew there wasn't any choice. It was this or wait to die. I nodded. We cracked open the front door. The night outside was still, deceptively peaceful. Birdsong had long since cut off, leaving an unnatural silence hanging heavy in the air. Anya squeezed my hand, then we stepped across the threshold, flashlight beams slicing through the darkness. The green belt, usually barely more than a patch of overgrown grass, looked sinister with the shadows stretching out. Every rustle of leaves had me clutching the shotgun tighter. It felt like hours passed, strung together with tension, but couldn't have been more than a few minutes. Then I saw a movement— that sickly green glint emerged from the bushes. The thing crouched low, its wrinkled hide shifting as it moved. My mind screamed, but my body was frozen. Then Anya, of all things, let out a little sob. That seemed to snap me out of it. I raised the shotgun and fired. The blast was deafening in the night's silence. The creature shrieked, not like any animal I'd ever heard. It thrashed, then fell still. It lay curled on the ground, motionless. We approached cautiously, hearts pounding. It was dead. The blast had torn into its side, and there was something viscous and black pooling beneath it. What the hell? Was all Anya could get out. I couldn't even muster that. It wasn't natural, any of it. The creature looked so pathetic now, the threat wiped away. Yet a sense of unease wouldn't leave me. It was then, as I looked closer, that something occurred to me. 
I remembered those empty green eyes, the hunched posture. It reminded me of those old stories folks tell around here, about a desert demon. They call it the skinwalker, say it takes the shape of animals, twists itself. It never felt real before, just campfire tales. Now, well, now I knew better. The aftermath was messy. Cops came, of course, but one look at that carcass had them stumped. Animal control was no help either. We burned it. The smell was horrendous, lingering in the air long after the ashes cooled. I think that smell will haunt me more than any of it. I ain't slept right since that night, and I doubt I ever will. We don't talk about it now, Anya and me. What could we say? Sometimes we pretend like it all just didn't happen. Life goes on, I guess. It always does, one way or another. I'm Caden, and back in October... I decided to go on a solo camping trip up to the White Mountains in New Hampshire. Needed some time away from the city noise, that never-ending grind. Figured it was the perfect fall weather to get out there too. Not too hot, not too cold. Got some great shots out there of the foliage, too. Those reds and oranges, man, they were something else. Anyway, I'd been out there two nights by the time things got weird. I'd been real careful, packed in my own firewood, pitched camp a good distance from the trail like always, bear-proofed all my food, all that responsible camper stuff. I felt way more at peace there than I had in a long time, even being all by myself. On that third morning, I get up with the birds, boil some water for coffee, the whole backwoods routine. It's barely light out yet, and the woods are shrouded in this hazy mist that's not quite fog. I'm sitting there, sipping my muddy coffee, just letting the quiet sink in. Then I hear it. It's like this clicking noise. At first, I think it's just a critter, maybe a squirrel. But it's too slow, too rhythmic. Click, click, click. I get up, try to pinpoint the sound, but with the mist... I can't see more than a few yards in any direction. There's a chill in the air that ain't right, not for fall. Click, click, click. Whatever it is, it's getting closer. My heart starts doing that nervous strum in my chest. I'm not a jumpy guy usually, but being alone like that. Your head starts inventing all sorts of stories to fill in the blanks. Figured it was probably just my imagination playing tricks on me. Still, my hand drifts over to the bear spray on my belt. I hear a rustle then and whip around towards a nothing. Then a twig snaps, sharper this time, real close. I call out, Hey! Anyone there? Just silence. And those clicks, a bit faster now it seems. My pulse is racing the hairs standing up on the back of my neck. I'm thinking, whatever's out there, it's playing with me. I should hightail it back to my car, but I feel glued to the spot, almost hypnotized by the sound. Click, click, click. I look up, and I swear my blood freezes in my veins. Through the mist, I see a shape. It's tall, way taller than a person. Its limbs are long and spindly, twisted like dry branches. And its head, there's no face, no eyes, just a blank, bony lump where a face should be. It's holding something out, like a long, rusty pipe, maybe? And it's making those clicking sounds with it, tapping the pipe against its leg. It's just standing there, not five yards away, those clicks almost deafening now. I finally snap out of my trance and do the only thing that makes sense. I run. I tear through the underbrush, branches whipping past my face, not caring where I'm going. All I can hear behind me is the frantic beat of my own heart and those relentless clicks. 
Click, click, click. Every second I expect gnarled claws to clamp onto my shoulder, hot breath to scorch my neck. Somehow, I break through a thicket and see an old logging road. I sprint for it, not even looking back. I run until my lungs are fire, until the clicking sound fades into the distance. Staggering, I lean against a tree, trying to catch my breath. I must have run for miles, the adrenaline pumping so pure I felt like I could keep going forever. My brain was still spinning, trying to process what the hell I just saw. I'd always scoffed at those campfire stories, the urban legends about monsters in the woods. Now I wasn't so sure. I never finished that camping trip, packed up all my gear with shaking hands and got the hell out of there. Didn't even wait for daybreak. The drive back home was a blur. Hands clenched on the wheel, hard a hummingbird trapped in my ribs. I was on autopilot. Every creak of the car, every rustle of leaves and the wind sent jolts through me. I kept replaying the whole thing in my head, over and over. What the hell was that underscore thing, underscore a prank? Some twisted hermit messing with hikers? But those legs, like gnarled sticks, that long, rusty pipe glinting in its skeletal hand, it felt too real to be a hoax. I got home and immediately buried myself in online searches. Figured someone somewhere must have seen something similar. Hours went by, old forum posts about Bigfoot sightings, blurry photos, local campfire tales, nothing matched my experience. Frustrated, I slammed my laptop shut. This was insane. I needed a drink, something strong, to knock the edge off. The next morning, I woke up with a throbbing head and a sick feeling in my stomach. The fear wasn't gone. Something had changed in me. I couldn't just write it off as a bad trip, a weird dream. I knew, deep down, the woods were hiding something I wasn't meant to see. Over the following days, I tried to get back to my normal routine. But my mind kept drifting back. The clicking sound haunted my dreams, waking me in a cold sweat. Every time I walked outside, I could swear I felt eyes on me. It got to the point where I could barely leave my apartment. I was jumpy, paranoid, a shell of my old self. One Wednesday, I was checking the news online when a headline made my blood run cold. Hiker missing in White Mountains my hands trembled as I clicked the link. The photo of the missing guy, a fresh-faced outdoors a type named Ethan, made my stomach clench. It said he vanished on the same trails I was on, around the same time I had my encounter. Fear clawed at my throat. Could that creature have taken him? It was the only explanation that made sense. I scrolled down, my eyes scanning frantically for details. It said his campsite was found abandoned, gear scattered. No sign of foul play, no leads. Just another vanished hiker. I snapped my laptop shut. That was it. I couldn't stay locked up in my apartment like a terrified animal anymore. I had to do something. If that thing was still out there, it was a danger to others. But calling the cops? Telling them about a monster with a metal pipe and no face? They'd haul me off to the psych ward. That night I hashed a plan. Crazy or not, I couldn't wait. I packed a duffel bag, flashlight, bear spray, hunting knife, and an old camera I had knocking around. Figured at the very least I could document something, anything. I drove back up to the mountains, my gut twisting with equal parts fear and determination. I parked near the trail Ethan had disappeared from. The air was thick, full of buzzing insects, that same oppressive silence as before. I hiked in, each step feeling heavier than the last. 
My eyes darted between the trees, my skin crawling with the constant sense of being watched. As I reached the general area where I encountered the creature, I paused. Calling its name, the one that came to me in those frantic seconds, seemed foolish, even dangerous. But it was the only thing I could think of. Stickman, I whispered, my voice raspy. Stickman, come out. Silence. I waited, barely breathing. My heart hammered a wild rhythm against my ribs. Then, movement on the edge of my vision. I whipped around. There it was, just at the edge of the tree lean. That same twisted form, head tilted slightly as if curious. Rage bubbled up inside me, hot and acidic, anger at this thing, at my own fear, at Ethan. I hefted the camera, fumbling with the settings. It was just a blur in the low light. Then I charged forward, screaming incoherently. The creature startled, then turned and bolted into the undergrowth, those impossibly long limbs propelling it away at unnatural speed. I chased it, branches lashing my face, adrenaline a firestorm in my veins. I had to get a clear shot, proof. The ground dropped away suddenly, and I tumbled head over heels into a ravine. Pain exploded in my ankle as I landed hard. I tried to stand, but my leg buckled uselessly. Groaning, I dragged myself into the shadows as the clicking sounds grew closer. The creature was circling me. I fumbled for the bear spray, my hands slick with sweat. It emerged from the trees, pipe glinting dully. As it came closer, I clicked the flash. That blinding burst of light seemed to startle it. It hissed and retreated, vanishing back into the darkness. I huddled there, trembling, until dawn painted the sky gray. It took every ounce of strength to haul myself out of the ravine, back up to the trail. I limped to my car, a trail of blood marking my path. I knew my ankle was broken, but I'd gotten a photo. It was proof. Finally, I had something to show the world.